Thank you and welcome. Um, I just would like to say uh, this is it's a real privilege to introduce this first uh, UK Moth Recorders face-to-face -face meeting since 2020. Um, and, uh, and, and I can tell that uh, that is something from the number of people that booked on uh, that lots of people wanted to see happen again. So that's really great. I think uh, last year when we did this uh, online, um, my colleagues and I spoke to you about the Sporting Science Project. That has now come to an end and uh, we really still remain really excited about everything it's achieved in terms of improving data flow, in terms of support for county recorders and online collaboration as well. Um, and it's great to see that people are dipping into the county recorder toolkit uh, on the website as well. So please do continue doing that. And if you think there's any resources that uh, you'd like to see on there, do get in touch with Zoe and, and let her know. Another achievement from the Sporting Science Project was getting 46 million uh, butterfly and moth records onto the MBN uh, Atlas Gateway. And what's really great about that is it obviously <coughs> opens up all those records to so many other people to see what species they've got on their doorstep. So it's a really great way of, of engaging people in butterflies and moths. Um, Supporting Science was funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and the uh, Department of Culture, Media and Sport, so I've done that plug. Um, and uh, as part of it, we had quite a rigorous evaluation. And what was really nice about that is part of that evaluation included actual uh, interviews with people who participated. Uh, and so it included actual comments from people, mostly good, some not so good, but that's fine. Um, and I actually read through them before uh, today to see whether I could actually pick out some, some nuggets for you. I then realised that actually to do that I'd have to go and explain the context of each of the comments and that would just make uh, life impossible and it would steal all the thunder from my colleagues. So I'm going to leave them to, uh, to give you all of those sorts of updates. Another major advance in 2023 was the launch of our new uh, volunteer uh, support system, Assemble. Um, that's come about uh, to support all butterfly conservation volunteers, whether they're members or not. And, and it's also helped butterfly conservation meets its uh, legal and insurance obligations. And we do hope that all recorders find it useful, gives them access to additional training, uh, news, plus allows, uh, allows you to connect to other volunteers via the messaging and uh, forums. Uh, this is going to be rolled out in 2024. Um, some invites have already gone out, but if you've not had an invite uh, to uh, join up by uh, April, then do get in touch with the volunteering team at Butterfly Conservation. <coughs> of course, as well as the wonder and the pleasure that goes uh, with recording moths, it's also all of that really important data that we use in our conservation actions and to measure our success or our failures uh, in doing that work. Understanding the changing range and status of species is critical as we have to adapt to climate change, whether that's the more intense um, weather instances we're, we're seeing, drought or heavy rainfall, um, or whether that's the effect it's having on species flight periods, that type of thing. And, and I think it's just worth, worth remembering that uh, our ability to be able to track these changes through species records is, is really important, as well as being able to use those records to understand whether our management uh, uh, advice is actually delivering for species. So uh, all I can say really at the start of what is going to be a very packed day, we've got a lot to get in. Uh, a note to speakers, please keep to time. And uh, a big thank you uh, for the stall holders. There's lots of opportunity for you to all mingle as well. And, uh, and thank you so much for uh, being involved in uh, uh, and sharing your passion about moths and inspiring others as well. Thank you. Lovely, thank you. And I'm gonna say it again, it is amazing to see you all and it's a little bit intimidating because I've not stood here for like four years. So um, welcome back, everybody. So as is traditional, I'm going to give you an update on the uh, National Moth Recording Scheme. 
So we are now at 34.5 million macro moth records in the National Moth Recording Scheme database. Um, almost 1.3 million records has been imported by Les, our database manager, since October last year. So he's been going great guns. Um, data import was on hold as a result of the butterflies for the new millennium data set migration, but that's all completed now. So he, Les is cracking on with getting your moth records back in to the data set database. Um, on average, we have round about 1.3 million macro moth records submitted to the NMRS each year. So that's just absolutely phenomenal and that's testament to all of your <coughs> efforts and of course the efforts of the county moth recorders who are busy verifying that data and incorporating it into local data sets and sending it on up to us. <coughs> Um, we're still a little bit short on some data sets and these figures on, in red here show um, the number of data sets that we're still yet to receive for those years. And obviously county recorders are currently very busy incorporating, you know, sorting out the 2023 records ready for submission by the end of March this year. So um, any county recorders need any help um, or support, then please get in touch and we'll see if we can get you some verification assistance to help you with that monumental task. So moving on to micro moth records, um, a bit of a slower, slower sort of uh, number of records, well, much fewer records, micro moth records in the National Moth Recording Scheme. We're currently at 6.5 million records and Les has imported almost 600,000 of those since October. And again, this graph shows the number of records on the Y axis and the, month, uh, the years on the, on the uh, X axis. So, oh, and we get round about um, 300,000 micro moth records submitted each year. So, again, quite a lot fewer, but more about micro moths shortly. Um, so, altogether, we have got a whopping 41 million verified moth records in the National Moth Recording Scheme, which is absolutely phenomenal. And I'm not sure that there's a data set out there that's any bigger than that, actually. So, I challenge anybody to try and find a bigger data set. So, uh, well done, everybody. And I've been inspired by the um, January Moth Challenge, and I thought, well, I'll have a look in the NMRS database and see how many macro moth species have been recorded by month. And here you are, we've got the, the graph here, and it shows that, you know, in the win January, February, there's few moth records, and as the season progresses, the number of species recorded increases, peaking at a whopping 849 species in July, and then again tailing off um, over, the, over the autumn and winter. Um, so that's the number of species. And then looking at the number of macro moth records, again, we've got that seasonal variation, very few records for the winter, creeping up in spring. And look at that, 9.4 million macro moth records submitted for the month of July. I mean, phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. So, uh, and again, tailing off in the autumn and the winter. Um, so, <coughs> then I thought, well, I wonder what moth is the most recorded moth each month? It's quite a mouthful, that. <coughs> so, in January, surprise, surprise, we've got the winter moth. In February, pale brindle beauty. In March, April and May, um, <laughs> Hebrew character. <laughs> I mean, we open up the trap and, oh, crikey, look how many. Do I have to count all of those? <laughs> and there's loads of those. Um, and then in June, it's the really impressive heart and dart. Um, July, the dark arches. I mean, most of these are mothers' moths, let's face it. There's no, you know, elephant hawks in there, um, but never mind. Um, and August, September, October, <laughs> it's our other favourite, the large yellow underwing blundering about in the trap, exciting everything else. They're all flying out because these have got, you know, their knickers in a twist and they're all, oh, let me out the trap. And um, so there, you know, and it will be no surprise to many of you that the large yellow underwing is the most recorded moth in the National Moth Recording Scheme. And then in November, we've got the lovely little fluffy, beautiful December moth. I mean, who who doesn't love a December moth? And they look like chocolate, velvety chocolate. You could almost eat them. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't recommend it, um, especially if you're vegetarian. And then again, in December, we've got the, uh, the winter moth. So, and, uh, 
And the, um, I don't know, if, just a quick plug for the What's Flying Tonight app and website. So this is um, freely available to everybody. It's based on National Moth Recording Scheme data. And what you can do is you can plug in, you know, type in or the, your location, and it will give you the um, most recorded moths that you're likely to see in that particular place at that particular time. And so it's web-based and there's also a smartphone app as well. And what I've found with it is it's really quite useful to help with some identifications as well. So I um, really recommend that app. And wouldn't it be great if we could get enough micro moth records and have one for micro moths too? Anyway, they are. It's a challenge for all of us. So looking at the number of micro moth species recorded in the National Moth Recording Scheme by month, again, seasonal variation, few records in the um, winter and a yeah, few in records in the winter, creeping up in spring and again peaking in July with 1,473 micro moth species in the national scheme. Um, and looking at the number of records, again, very few, January, February, March starts to creep up in April, May, June, crescendos into 2.1 million records uh, in, in July and then again tailing off. But I mean, the number of micro moth records in the national scheme is 126% fewer than the number of macro moth records. So uh, there we go. And um, looking at micro moths recorded by month, um, well, here we go. No surprises, the Januarys, the <laughs> light brown apple moth. I'm not even going to try and, um, what's it, um, pr pronounce the Latin scientific name. More about those shortly. Um, in February, we've got um, the spring harbinger. Harbinger, yes. So that's one of the new English names. Bit easier to pronounce than that, whatever that is, says there. Tortricodes alternella. Um, then we've got the early reveller. I used to be a late reveller, but these days I'm an early reveller. And um, so March, that's the most popular, most recorded moth. April is the common plume. May, again, light brown apple moth. June, small magpie. I mean, a beautiful little micro moth that most anybody could probably identify. So not all micros are really tricky. Um, then in July, we've got one of the grass moths. And this one has been renamed with the common name the gra garden grass moth, that's grass with five A's. And then in August, we've got the common grass moth. And then surprise, surprise, <laughs> light brown apple moth, September, October, November, December. And um, yeah, so, uh, and again, no surprises, light brown apple moth is the most recorded um, micro moth in the national scheme. So now I'm just going to briefly hand over to a special guest, and I promise you he's not trapped in my computer. And here he is. Hello, Moth Recorders. Uh, sorry I can't be with you today. And thank you, Zoe, for allowing me a couple of minutes to talk about the new and exciting second edition of the Field Guide to Micromoths, um, put together by Mark Parsons and myself, and as always, wonderfully illustrated by Richard Lewington. Uh, three standout changes from the first edition. Firstly, it's much thicker. We've been able to include a lot more species, uh, about 300 uh, species that weren't in the first edition. And we've um, been able to update the taxonomy so that it is in line now with the Agassiz, Bevan and Hegford checklist. And this time we've included a full list and have reviewed um, all the vernacular or English names. So to take the first, the additional species, we've included a wide range of species from a range of uh, different families where uh, species were, were, for various reasons, absent last time. For instance, when we started writing the first edition, box tree moth hadn't even been recorded in Britain. Now, in most of southern England, it's an abundant species in moth traps. We've also taken a more systematic approach to uh, some of the poorly uh, covered families last time. So in the Galechiidae and Depressariidae and some of the smaller families where we didn't cover them that well, uh, we've been able to do that much more comprehensively. So this time, for instance, we have uh, around 50 Galechiid uh, 
uh, included within the book. But one of the other differences is a more systematic approach to how we've used photographs of the early stages, 80% um, of which have been taken by Ben Smart. And as you know, Ben takes the most fantastic um, uh, photographs of the early stages. So we've been able to um, be much more comprehensive in the Nepticulidae, in the Gracilariidae and the Coleophoridae, as well as some of the smaller groups we didn't manage to cover last time, with the aim specifically of being able to encourage uh, recorders to um, uh, identify to species level where that is possible based on photographs of the early stages. Um, most controversially, of course, is the inclusion of the list of English names. Um, and for some people, this will have been, we've committed a crime. For others, they will be absolutely delighted. The main reason we've done this is because um, there are far too many people who are put off recording micromoths because we don't include English names. For them, the, the Latin and Greek derivations to them is just a step too far. And we want micromoth recording to be as inclusive as possible. We have reviewed the names because I think um, many of you, and myself included, will find that the old names were frankly daft in places, um, uh, misleading, uh, inappropriate. So calling all the Tineidae clothes moths doesn't really help with the conservation of a really interesting and fascinating family of micromoths. Well, we really hope you enjoy using this book. As always, if you find any uh, mistakes within the book, or, or um, please let us know. And we really hope you have a good coming season, and indeed several seasons, recording using the book. Thank you. As Russell mentioned, we have um, developed this county recorder toolkit. It was a monumental piece of work. It was co-created with the county recorder network and the other recorders. And it's been really useful. I find it really useful. And I think hopefully lots of county recorders are finding it really useful as well. And there's lots of bits in there to delve into. Do go in, have a delve around, have a poke around and explore it and find the bits that are useful for you. I will mention um, section six in particular. This, um, I'm getting with the modern age look, this QR code will link straight through to the county recorder toolkit. Thank you for Cl to Chloe for making that one for me. Section six covers a lot of the verification um, tools that are available now in, in, in the toolkit. And one of the things that I think is really, really exciting and really useful are these record validation spreadsheets developed by a county moth recorder, Mark Hubit, up in Scotland. So he's developed these. It enables you to validate and verify records in a spreadsheet. You can just upload them. Potentially erroneous records are colour coded and to help you, and you can see here, you know, it can help you pick out potentially dodgy records. The spreadsheet can also reformat data, even if it's cross-tab. So all those garden moth scheme records that come in cross-tab formats that have county recorders tearing the hair out, well, this spreadsheet can reformat them in uh, one record per row. Um, and also, uh, what's the word, reformat them into iRecord or MapMate format as well. And I personally think that this is a really, really useful tool for the grassroots recorders to use prior to them submitting their records to their county recorder, because then they will, you know, they will be able to spot the potentially dodgy records, they'll improve their learning, and on more importantly, it will help reduce the workload for county recorders. So please do have a look at the, the toolkit. And again, as Russell or Richard said earlier, anything that you think, oh, this, uh, this is a tool that I use, it's really helpful, really useful, I think we should share it with the County Recorder and Verification Assistant Network, then, you know, let me know and we can pop it on there. So, <coughs> as Richard and Russell mentioned earlier, we have um, uploaded 47 million butterfly and moth, macro moth records to the MBN Atlas. So I'm just going to give you a, and it's, the MBN Atlas to me is not particularly intuitive, um, so, but then I'm not very technical. But anyway, so I'm just going to give you a quick walkthrough of how you can dive into those, into that MBN Atlas and explore 
the macro moth record. So the first thing you do is you click on you you click on this 47 million odd records button there, and that will take you to um, uh, the occurrence records page, and then you click on customize filters here. And then in there, you can choose scientific name or common name. So I've chosen to untick <coughs> scientific name and tick common name. And then you click um, update. Then it will come up with a list of, of taxon. And again, you can choose from here which particular moth species you want to look at or several moth species. So I chose the, um, and then see so down, and then you click there, choose more, because you can only see half a dozen or so there. That brings up a drop-down menu. I've selected Garden Tiger, and then you click Include Selected Records. Press the button again, and then you get, when you click on the Map tab, you get the distribution of the moth at 100 kilometres square resolution. Not particularly useful, but if you use the, then you can click on Occurrence as well, and you can filter by month and by year, and so I've selected here the month of June and the year of 2018. So this now shows, and by zooming in and out, using the in and out zoomy buttons, this map now shows the distribution of Garden Tiger at 50 kilometre square resolution and 10 kilometre square resolution. And again, you can zoom in a bit more, again using the zoom in and zoom out tools, and then it will show you the distribution of that moth at 2 kilometre square resolution. So that's just a quick whiz through that. Um, all of the macro, most of the macro moth species on the MBN Atlas are displayed at two kilometre square resolution, and um, apart from the um, sensitive species, which are, are, are shown at a greater resolution. So that's almost me done. There's another look at this with the modern age. I'm Generation X, and I'm straddling digital and analog, and slowly doing the splits. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, so this QR code will take you to the, to the um, MBN Atlas, to the data sets, and then there's the, the, the uh, web address there as well. So you've probably seen this slide before, but I would just like to, s oh no, yes, you have seen this slide before. All of your records that you collect and the county recorders verify and feed into the national scheme inform all of butterfly conservation's work. Your records are our evidence base. And without your records, we couldn't do virtually anything that we do. So the records are used for single species conservation, landscape scale conservation, advice to landowners, be that the highways agency or a small hilltop farmer in Scotland. Um, the data are used by scientific researchers and <coughs> university students. We produce distribution trends. We produce red lists and obviously... Um, there's the Atlas of Britain and Ireland's Larger Moths that was published a few years ago. If you haven't got one, I really recommend that you do because you've got distribution maps in there and flight charts and trends and everything, and it's a real mine of information. And also we've got the state of butterfly uh, moths reports as well. Oh, I nearly, nearly swore, nearly said the B word. And, um, <laughs> but we've got some state of moths reports up at the reception desk and again, we use it in all of our outreach work. So I would just like, and you've definitely seen this one before, and I haven't got rid of it because I love it. So I would just like to say <laughs> thank you to every single one of you in here, county recorders, verification assistants, and, um, and grassroots recorders who submit, you know, spend your hobby time collecting records, which are then used for you know, the much wider good. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure what three county recorders these are yet. So I don't know. <laughs> if anyone wants to volunteer themselves, let me know. So um, that's me done, and I think I've kept to time. Crikey, I have. So I'd just like to say thank you all. Lovely to see you all. And, um, and I think we do have a couple of minutes for questions, which is very untraditional for me. Thank you. <laughs>I'm feeling a bit cold, um, but I guess you're all very hardy because you're all out at night with your moth traps. Um, so I might just shuffle around a bit while <laughs> I'm talking. Um, but it's a real, real pleasure to be here. This is my first UK moth recorders meeting in person, in real life. Um, and yeah, it's a fantastic day. It's really, really fun. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about supporting and sustaining the next generation of moth recorders and verifiers.
Did that move on? No. I'll do it like this. So we're all here because we love moths, um, no denying that. And also we all are passionate about moth data and recording moths as well and verifying moths for many of you too. Um, but we know, and we did hear some, some figures about this earlier, that moths are in trouble. And in the UK, we've witnessed through data a significant decline in the abundance of moths over the last 40 years. And they're not immune to the climate and biodiversity crises that we're experiencing. Um, but we've also heard from Zoe, and we're going to hear in lots of other talks today, that there are plenty of things that we're trying to do about that together and how important your records and data are to that. So this is probably the least accurate, precise figure that you're going to see today. <laughs> it's notoriously difficult to estimate the number of people who have contributed to the national recording schemes, but we think it's something like this, maybe more. Um, different people who have um, recorded <coughs> butterflies or moths for the UK national schemes. And uh, that is the capacity of the O2 arena. So I thought that I had to show a picture of that to visualise it. So maybe 40-50% of the people in the O2 arena could be moth recorders. So I'm thinking maybe we need to be there the next in-person meeting. Um, so the reason why I've mentioned this is because I think many people might say, well, haven't you got enough recorders? Aren't there enough people involved already? Do you really need to be uh, encouraging more? Um, but we do, and I'll, I'll touch on why in the next few slides. So as you all know, moths are a large and very diverse group, um, present in diverse habitats across the UK. And therefore, there's lots of scope for specialisation and um, room for people who are generalists and beginners, as well as very experienced experts focusing on, on um, subgroups of moths. And even some of the more common species, as we know, are difficult to tell apart, can be. Um, and therefore, it's also really important that we have that the specialists doing verification and checking the records from those tens of thousands of recorders. And welcome to the many county recorders who are here today. But county recorders are much fewer in number, so around 100 for moths in the UK. And clearly, as we've seen from Zoe's talk, an awful lot of records, a, a big workload is coming their way. So there's a few different reasons why we want to encourage more people to be involved in volunteering and learning about verification there. When we surveyed um, with Wild Crew from Oxford University, the County Moth Recorders in 2020, we also heard directly from them that their workload has significantly increased. So a whopping 77% of people identified that their workload had increased. And this is a concern, even though it's a good thing that more data are coming through, that are so useful to, to um, tackling those problems with moths um, declines. It is a concern because the volunteering role does need to be enjoyable and it needs to be sustainable into the future. So there are a number of different things that we can do about addressing this. And one of them clearly is improving systems because it's to do with data and um, so I wanted to mention that first we we are really mindful of this and in the last couple of years through the supporting science project that you heard Russell um, introducing earlier we've been working closely with the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and county recorders themselves to address changes that can be made to systems to help with handling more data more efficiently but really no matter how perfect and smooth the systems are and we will continue to do work on that um, with the number of recorders and records coming through, it also takes people. So the other strand of what, what we want to do more of is developing more um, teams and shared uh, work at this volunteering. So we're strengthening the people. So each county recorder can be supported by others and the skills can develop within the community and create that resilience within the community. And at any one time, there's usually two or three vacancies within the county recorder network as well. So you can see that there's always a need for, for new people to be coming through and, um, and developing those skills. And it can take years, decades to gain the experience that it requires to be a, a county recorder and to coordinate others in that work. But obviously you have to start somewhere. So that brings me to training and learning, and uh, th that goes hand in hand with, with these strategies. Um, obviously, there's lots of different ways of training and learning, and it's a big part of what we all do and why we enjoy recording, um, developing our skills and learning more about identification. 
And one of the effects of learning more is that you can then submit better records. And as we develop our skills and learn more about what makes a good record, that can help county moth recorders when they verify our data. But the other side of that is um, learning to identify and specialise within the field and learning about those data systems um, could make today's moth recorder into tomorrow's county moth recorder. So through the Supporting Science Project, we wanted to experiment and innovate and try something a bit new regarding training and learning. And this was not to replace the traditional routes into volunteering and, and recording and verifying, but to see if we could supplement those and complement them with an online learning pathway. So this is a sort of visualisation of how we perceive this from the moth perspective. So we wanted to see if an interested person who could take a moth identification course online could then take this learning in different directions. So they might simply enjoy the course and then talk more about moths and be more enthused about moths and that, that in itself is a, is a really good thing. Or they might use what they're learning to do more citizen science, more recording and better recording so that again that helps with that workload of the county recorders or they might want to do more learning. So it was important that we had a pathway of different connected courses that people could do online, um, including butterflies. Um, and that could include data systems. And we focused on iRecord as being um, the, the data system to learn. And then taken all together, some individuals from those cohorts may want to go on and step into volunteering, be that field volunteering, or we hoped we'd get a cohort of new verification assistants to support county recorders. So this, this was our theory, and we worked closely with the Field Studies Council on, on developing this. So through the Supporting Science Project, we worked with the Field Studies Council and all the learning that they'd gained from their BioLinks project, and they'd delivered a lot of online training um, with people there. And we developed this, this pathway. This pathway. Um, so we had the two courses in identification, one for distinctive butterflies and one for distinctive moths. And we were lucky to receive additional funding from the National Heritage Lottery Fund for uh, a second rerun of the moths course as well. We also did a mothy butterfly edition of the very popular and ongoing Field Studies Council Discovering I Record course. And then finally, we developed qu uh, quite a, a slightly more complicated um, follow-on course um, focusing on verification within iRecord, and that was with the support of UKCEH. So in terms of the content of these courses and the kind of thing that we were trying for the first time, really, um, we, these were hosted in Moodle which is an online learning platform, and they were free to access, which was important to us. And Moodle creates a sort of workbook style course, and that meant that we could use lots of different types of media as well. So we had text, photograph, we used videos, some that we created from scratch, others that we brought in from other places. Um, we used infographics and lots of visuals. You can see some visuals there for the moth identification, sort of really picking up those key features. The system also had quizzes, which tests people's knowledge as you go through, so you can self-assess, and then a final sort of quiz-like assessment at the end to complete the course. And a really important part of the development of the identification course was which species to focus on, because it was a real experiment seeing if we could teach um, identification of moths online in this way, instead of um, in, in the field at the trap. So. We spent quite a bit of time thinking about this and we decided that we wanted moths that were reasonably widespread, not necessarily the most common or the first that you'd see, but reasonably widespread for across the UK. Importantly, that they would be easy to identify from photographs, so be they your own photographs or photos of that you were receiving from other people. And then finally, we asked the county recorders themselves to help us with this question, um, that they would be useful should somebody go on to be verifying these species in iRecord. They would be useful for the county moth recorders to have assistance with those data. So we polled the county recorders, we talked internally about it, we looked at some data from iRecord, and these are the moths that we came up with. So hopefully some familiar friends in there. And I think seeing them all together, you can see that they are quite distinctive. So these are our distinctive moths. And 
As Russell mentioned, we used um, the opportunity to gather feedback from the participants at the time in the course, and then also we did an evaluation of the whole project later. So I've wanted to pull out in yellow some of the comments that we got back from people through that and some of the statistics. In terms of the identification course, this is what people were telling us that they really liked about the course. So it, this was an entirely self-led course and people did appreciate that, being able to go at their own pace and, and test themselves with the quizzes. Um, also, making sure that we included confusion species, so we didn't only focus on the focus moth, we had the confusion species that they could um, learn to distinguish between as well. Um, so we had a lot of nice positive comments. Some of the, um, the things that people picked out that they weren't so keen on or that they just recommended we changed, for the second rerun we were able to tweak, so that was a, that was a really good opportunity. And for the verification course, that one was a bit different and it was more tutor-led and it included live webinars. And the thing that really stood out for people was the practicality of that course and the, the fact that they were able to look at real examples and real data and actually practice as well straight away. Um, so that's thanks to the county recorders who helped with that as well, um, it providing opportunities for people to see real data. And that's Rachel delivering a, a, a webinar there. So from the evaluation and the feedback and, um, and the numbers, this is what we found. We feel that it was successful. Um, I mean, staggering numbers of people came to the identification courses. We were really, really pleasantly surprised by this. 842 people completed. So they not only did it, but they completed the, the Moth ID course. And then in the second rerun, an, another 100 or so. Um, 730 for the butterflies. So the moth were more popular than the butterflies. Um, we had um, quite a few people going on and doing the, um, the more systems focused courses as well. And importantly from the evaluation we found that people were using, the majority of people were using these skills that they'd learned and felt more confident about their ID after taking the courses, which is really fantastic and surely supporting the, the data that are coming through the system. And we, for the verification course, we opened up expressions of interest to those who'd completed the, the entry courses. So there was a limited number of spaces and, we t and there were 49 were taken up. And actually we could have filled that several times over because the interest was so great, which is fantastic. Um, and the best news of all is that we did, in the end, um, result with 20 new volunteers so who took all of these courses and wanted to continue working in a voluntary capacity um, doing verification. And hopefully, if the video works, you're going to hear firsthand from some new volunteers in, in the next piece. <coughs> I wanted to just spend a couple of moments um, thinking about who took part in the courses as well. Um, so again, through the feedback, we were able to understand a little bit about the demographics of people who took the course. And it's really interesting that the blue, the blue, chart, um, the blue chart shows the verification course that we ran at the beginning, which was for existing volunteers. So it's a very similar course, um, but not, not at all sort of um, designed for beginners. And that shows the typical demographic of volunteers that we have now doing verification. So tending more towards the retirement age and more men than women. Then the beginner volunteers who took part in the, the, the trainee course, uh, it was kind of flipped that round. So we had some different age groups being represented and more women than men. So taken together, these two <coughs> ways of, of entering into volunteering and learning about verification seem to really complement each other for widening audiences and having a, a, a diverse group of people taking part. So I'll just conclude with what we learned um, from, from this and from trying something new. Um, well, clearly, people really love recording moths and learning about moths, and that this includes being on, online. Um, the, the numbers coming to the ID courses were fantastic. So that's perhaps no surprise. But we did also um, identify that there was this need to make sure that the online working, the online training would work so that we could improve, um, the, keep the data flowing and improve the support, <coughs> excuse me, for county recorders. And we feel that we have showed that you can, with careful consideration for the species that you feature and the way that you um, the teach and structure the course, that you can teach identification of moths online successfully and also that this sort of digital pathway into um, 
MOF ID and recording and verification is possible and complements the more traditional routes into volunteering in this area. So next, we've worked with the biological <coughs> recording company to embed a, um, a slightly tweaked version of the verification course into our own systems now. So we can start offering that to new volunteers on a regular basis. Um, so it, it, it's not only going to be featuring this project, it's going to have its own life afterwards. Um, and we're hoping to do a similar thing with the ID courses as well in future. And as I say, hopefully if the video works, you'll be able to hear um, firsthand from some new volunteers next as well. So thank you to all of those who were involved and took part in the courses and helped to make them a success. Welcome April and Tim, and thanks very much for joining us today to um, share your route from Moth Recorder to Moth Verification Assistant via the Supporting Science Project. Thanks very much for joining us. Before we delve into the details of the training and the current role that you have, I'd like to understand a little bit more about your experience of wildlife and moth recording before you joined in the project. So um, April, I'll come to you first for that. What, did, what moth recording did you do before you joined in Supporting Science? I did a butterfly moth transit with the New Forest Group Walkers for a couple of years. And at the moment, I regularly record species, butterfly moth and species on I record on a regular basis while I'm walking down my local nature reserve. Great. So your, your moth recording, do you, are you doing any trapping or is it mainly day flying moths and other life just, stages that you're recording at the minute? Just day flying moths. Yeah, that's great. And some of our tra uh, training course species were day flying moths, weren't they? Because those are some of the first moths that people encounter when they start recording. So that was a really good, um, you know, sort of specialism to have on those day flying moths because a lot of records come in of that type. And, and Tim, over to you. How was it for you? What was your moth recording experience? Um, I think I got, I got into it um, through uh, existing recording uh, bird sightings and butterfly sightings, and then through a friend um, got um, interested in moth moth um, ver uh, moth trapping. Um, so built a very amateurish uh, moth trap um, and was interested to see what 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 kind of species that I could um, find within within my garden, just in yeah. kind of suburban Birmingham. Right? So mostly um, garden moth trapping for you and yes. some, some daytime observations as well. well. That's great. So you both had some existing knowledge of recording and how that works. Um, so what did you know about verification, though, before you started the training courses? I'll come to you first, April. Did you know about the process of verification and how that worked locally? I didn't know anything at all about it. Yeah. I, think, I think that's something that we forget, isn't it? That new recorders don't understand that there's a whole verification process with some human beings at the end who are trying to make sense of all these records that are coming in. And I certainly didn't know that 20 years ago. Um, when I first started submitting records, um, I didn't know there was a human being on the end looking at them. If, if I had known that, there was some records that wouldn't have gone in, I can tell you that. So, you know, it's, it's really interesting to hear you say that because I think that is something that we forget, that many new recorders don't realise that there's some human processing goes on of these records. Um, what about you, Tim? Did you understand the process of verification? Um, certainly not initially, no. I mean, I, I, when I first started recording um, uh, birds, for instance, I used bird track. And for um, moth recording, I used the moth recording website. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you, did, you don't really see the feedback and you didn't answer, I didn't know about the kind of integration of the data behind the scenes when I was using that. Um, but I think... There was a stage where I was actually contacted by the um, county recorder um, um, and asked for a, a bit more detail on a couple of, of the um, the records that I created. Um, and then the actual website that I was using, I think, was was being retired. Um, and the, the county recorder had then um, said about using iRecord instead. Um, so then I began using iRecord and then I could see the the emails you get when things are verified and you saw more of the feedback so so I had an idea of kind of what happened from that point on but that was probably a year or two into into actually recording yeah so I think I think that's one of the real pluses of iRecord is that you can get that feedback you get your green ticks and the 
county recorders and verification assistants can communicate with people and let them know you know if more information is needed um so uh, it's great to hear both of your experiences that they were kind of you know you were coming to it knowing a little or in april's case not very much at all but being able to transition now into being in a role where you are carrying out verification is fantastic so to 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 ask you a little bit more about that uh, how did you get involved in the supporting science project how did you find out about it were you in an existing network um april do you want to start us off there please yeah i started attending courses with the field study councils and i went on the iwe verification course and applied for a, the job as a assistant verifier so your main um sort of inroad was via the field studies council you didn't have any existing network with uh, butterfly conservation or or your or your local branch prior to that yeah not in the local branch no yeah okay so that's really interesting that's great for us to hear because you know we partnered with the field studies council because they do have a fantastic reach and can um reach a lot of very different people and bring in new people into the network and that was one of the reasons we partnered with them so it's great to hear that that brought you to us april so we're very pleased about that um what about yourself tim you had a little bit of you were in the network a little bit with your local moth contacts um yeah a little bit there and, and i think i was using um various Facebook groups sometimes to help me identify um, moths um, and I think then probably the the clever algorithms in in Facebook then linked the two up and I saw an advert for a field studies um, of field studies council um, yeah. uh, did, I think the initial one was the discovering I recall course so I signed up for that and uh, then that carried on onto a, a couple of different courses and eventually the the verification course came up yeah um, so it was kind well, of through that we really appreciate the commitment that both of you show by attending all of those courses because they were actually quite involved, weren't they? There was quite a lot of work um, involved in those. And we, we wanted to to make them really thorough because we wanted to have good verification assistance at the end. And I suppose we were sort of trying to, you know, demonstrate that you don't have to have like 20 or 30 years of experience to carry out some verification tasks. And um, and hopefully, you know, the fact that the two of you are working on active data sets is, is evidence of that. Um, so it, at what point in the training did you think, oh, I, I'd really quite like to have a go at verification. So I know you were following this natural progression of training courses. And did you just kind of keep going until the training courses ran out? Or did you actively think, you know, I think I'd like to contribute to verification in my area or, or in another area? Tim, I'll take that one to you first, please. Um, I, I think I think for me it would be um, I think through the courses I did, I got to the distinctive moths and butterfly course, um, and then from there, I think you was I was asked if I wanted to apply for the um, the actual verification training, um, and I think I think the actual invite for that um, you had to apply, and I think there was some detail on and expectations I, I mean before then i hadn't really thought about it and obviously um when when i saw that i thought that was um yeah something that i would i, I would like to do so um mm -hmm. yeah before that didn't that's really, great. really oh, think great. about it good so we we hooked you in yeah. we hooked you yes. in with an invite yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um and and april what elements of the training or the support that we provided through the project did you find most valuable in supporting you to develop ver verification skills just going on the I would call verification course. Did that did that give you you know a really good grounding and what you needed? Yeah, yeah. Did you think that was thorough as well, Tim? And did you have any thoughts about how that might be um, improved, or did you think it was a good grounding in in the in the skills required? No, no. I think it was a good grounding, and and I think from the initial kind of discovering I recall course that, that gave the kind of that groundwork and that understanding of of data flows and and, and what happens to that data once you record it. Um, yeah, I think I think that was a good basis um, to then move on to that further course, which then yeah took took you through real the detail of how you use the verification site because that that wasn't something you can see at all in I record until you're actually set up with the appropriate um, permissions in there. To, to actually yeah. use the tool to, to kind of its fullest extent. Then. And do you think um, 
through either being through the courses um, or being verification assistance that your own recording has improved. April. Yes, it has improved. In what way? Uh, I've actually learned about more about the species, what's available in my area, and also I've learned about different moth species. So you've increased your local knowledge. And what about the quality of the records that you're submitting? Does it give you a different slant on looking at your own record submissions now, knowing from your own experience what you need in terms of verification? Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Tim? What are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, definitely. So um, obviously through the, uh, the, I can't remember which course it was, but understanding um, the various uh, areas that make up a, a, the record, such as the location and things. Um, I, I didn't really understand grid references at all before I came into it. So that was one thing, um, probably wasn't the main reason for the course, but, but I came out of that understanding grid references. So then I understood um, how to increase that resolution of, of the records that I was creating. Um, and also using meaningful site names, not like my yeah. garden or something like that as well. Um, so I think that that's all really relevant. I think that that would improve exactly how I was recording some of the things. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, and I've put in some seriously dodgy records at the beginning of my recording career. And, um, and, and you know, I feel very passionately that we should be introducing recorders to the concept of verification, when, you know, through lots of different means, through our Facebook groups and through training, et cetera, and, and other events that need to get people on board with the idea of verification early on so that we can get that better quality data and, and also so we can, you know, increase the pool of potential verifiers for the future. I know you 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 are both working um because this is what we how we trained you initially in very distinctive species which are accompanied by a photograph uh species which you were very confident in we didn't want anybody to be in a position of, of verifying data that they weren't com comfortable with um are you starting to sort of expand your knowledge a bit now in terms of verification or are you are you sticking just with with what you know, April, you're nodding there. Are you doing a little bit more than you originally set out to do? Yes, I'm doing a lot more, like verifying with species. And I'm trying to learn about leaf miners as well, which I'm not very confident with or know about. Yeah, that's interesting. And you can do it all year round as well, can't you? So that's good. Something to keep yeah. us busy in the winter. And April, you do caterpillar as well, I think I remember. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so are you verifying some um caterpillar records in i record yeah that's right i'm doing the caterpillars yeah very good that's something that i'm not very good at at all so it's always admirable to hear someone who can um and and tim how about you what how do you feel about your contribution um well i think i think what i've expanded by um initially looking because there was obviously quite a big backlog when we first started yeah. um sort of trying to look at um probably mainly uh, macro moths looking at, at where there was big backlogs of sp particular species and then and then using a book to understand are any of those ones where there aren't sort of very similar species and so sort of make it easier so more more likely to be correct um, and try and work through those from that um, that way and, and and slowly expand in um, which species that um, I could record um, with um, with photos basically yeah because one of the things we felt with the support and science project was, you know, there's, there's, there's the set of distinctive species that come in and there's a lot of records generated and they are records which are often, you know, maybe introductory species for new recorders. So they've maybe gone out and seen a cinnabar or something like that. And they think it's, it's in the day, they're having a wildlife walk. It's very distinctive. They take a photograph of it. They want to do something with that and submit it. So there'll be a lot of records of that type. And, you know, it makes sense, doesn't it, to split the workload so that you've got some people who are very comfortable with those who can just go through all those and you can kind of reserve the people who have that really kind of superior knowledge for the more difficult species to be working on that and split that workload up because of that huge workload you were talking about, Tim. You know, it makes sense to come together as teams, you know, to split it up so that people aren't overwhelmed with this huge workload and dealing with lots and lots and lots of of records that that to them are you know kind of very familiar and common but to someone who's coming in you get a lot of enjoyment out of doing those what do you both enjoy the most about your verification role april 
I enjoy learning about moss species and helping the local area and the data, really. And helping process the data. And you just, yeah. you can't help but learn more things, can you? Because they're coming in and you're looking at them and you have a sneaky peek at what else is going on in your area as well while you're in there verifying. Oh, that's good. And is that the same for you, Tim? Yeah, definitely. I think it's, um, yeah, it's the, I guess, the challenge of, of, of going through and doing the verification. Then also, yeah, just that knowing that you're kind of helping out um, with science and, and kind of yeah, ecology type of stuff. Yeah. So you've both been quite new to the networks and you went through the training and you came out the other end as verification assistants. Do you think that is a path more people can follow, that more people can get involved in that way? Yes, definitely. I think so. Yeah, you would support that. And Tim, how do you feel about that path? Yeah, definitely. I think I think it's worked, yeah, for you. It, it's worked well, and I think I think it will work for for for, for other people definitely. Yeah, yeah. It, was there anything missing that you think might have been helpful? What what additional support would be beneficial to provide if you were going to encourage someone else to come in, or if you could give some feedback to us as the project facilitators? April, have you got anything you'd like to add? I'd suggest going on a course on discovering our record if you're not sure about how to use our record. Yeah. So it's essential to get that grounding, first of all, so you're more familiar with it when you get to the verification pages. Yeah. And Tim? Yeah, I'd, I'd definitely agree. I mean, I'd, I'd been using iRecord for a year or probably more before I went on the course and there was still quite a lot to learn even on the on the first basic course on how to use things and and even yeah. just sort of outside of I record just just the idea of what makes a, an actual record and, and all that kind of the basics um, I think it's really important to go through um, to give you that grounding and then to, to move 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 on to the to the more advanced courses. Fantastic. So you, you can know I record quite well as a recorder, but actually you only you kind of use a limited number of functions. So if you do do the discovery in I record, you get to learn a, a lot more. Um, and if you were going to give some advice to others who might want to start on a verification path, Tim, what would you say? Yeah, I think it would be to, to yeah, start, start, start and go through that, that structure, that, that set of, of, of training courses. Um, and, and yeah, not try and jump straight in at the deep end, but to go through um, and it's kind of a, a nice uh, approach and starting with the, um, the, the, the the easier species and things like that. So yeah, I definitely would, would take that Thanks. approach. Thanks, Tim. And how do you how do you feel about that, April? Or what advice would you give to someone thinking about embarking on verification? Yeah, I'd say like Joe, you know, local nature is serve and get to know his species and get to learn all his species uh, and go on our record verification course. Thanks very much. April and Tim, it was a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you very much for your absolute commitment from the start of the courses to the end and your perseverance with the training and for now undertaking the role you do. Thanks very much. Uh, well, hello conference and thanks very much for the opportunity. I think um, the, the first time I came here was around a decade ago and I always thought I'd never want to speak here because everyone's really high and you're sort of surrounded as well. Um, but here I am. Actually, we're running over a bit, so Ben, if you want to take over now, that's fine. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm just going to give a, a bit of a, before Ben talks about the book, just a quick five minute sort of introduction about the project that I work on um, and we are based in the entomology department at World Museum in Liverpool and we're externally funded by the Tuniptra Trust and it's all about promoting the study and conservation of insects and other invertebrates in the Lancashire and Cheshire region and there's two full-time staff and then a steering group of, of entomologists um, and we've got our just our contracts for our second extension of the project now we're going to 2029 so we're very excited about that um, and if you didn't know what Tuniptra was it's a genus of uh, deadwood crane flies um, very sort of they're wasp mimics big and showy if you saw one you probably take a photograph of them um, but it's a, the project is about all, all invertebrates so as as part of the project 
Um, we, d we do a lot of work around promoting vertebrate research and conservation, and we commission a few species, threatened species surveys um, each year. Um, so I just wanted to give an example of one that was commissioned for Justine Patton, the county moth recorder for macromoths for Vice County 60 in, in 2022. And we, we're very much reliant on the, the national re reviews that, that come out, the species status reviews, and, and there's been lots of them in the, in, the, in the past decade or so, and we really rely on those to, to say what is, what is threatened within, within the country. And then we look and uh, what species we have in northwest England, what is threatened, and then we, we prioritise our species surveys according to that. So in 2029, um, the least minor, this little macromoth was given the classified as, as endangered um, and so it was immediately on, on my radar and so we actually did a collaboration because I, I'm not allowed to go into Cumbria but Morecambe Bay is <laughs> we want to do a, a landscape survey obviously the least Meyer doesn't care about that so I did, we, we did a, a collaboration this survey which was also funded by Butterfly Conservation and National team as well as the Cumbria branch so, so that was really good to be able to do that um, but what I wanted to give Justine um, a few extra days because there was, in, in, in 2014, um, Phil Stern, Sterling and Barry Henwood found Lee Miner eating um, blue moor grass in the burren when they were looking for, for burren green caterpillars. And that information was, was put into the 2020 um, caterpillar book, um, but it had never been recorded on blue moor grass in England. Or the, or the UK, um, and it's always been referenced in the UK as, as something that eats um, Glaucus sedge. But if you, if you look at the distribution of blue moor grass, a limestone plant, and you look at Glaucus sedge, which is found in, in all hectares of the UK, and you look at the, uh, the distribution of, of least minor, there's, uh, which one matches better there? Um, <laughs> So, we th so it was, I thought it was well worth Justine having a look. And so in April 2022, um, there's um, uh, Ben Smart, Steve Palmer and Justin, Justine and I uh, went out looking for, for caterpillars and hooray. Ju so um, <coughs> Justine uh, found the first one in, in, in under an hour and found most of them. Uh, on the day, and, and there, it, there's a, a caterpillar there on the left, head down in the in the stem of uh, at the base of the uh, blue moor grass, and uh, yeah, and, and fortunately, um, um, Justine managed to rear through a few to absolutely confirm the ID, um, and found larvae all three of the sort of the target larval sites. Um, and so that, yeah, that was, that, was, that was an excellent outcome, really, of the, of the survey. I don't have time to go into the, to the results of the landscape adult survey, um, but I think one, you know, uh, a really important finding of that is that um, blue moorgrass may well be the, the, as well as glaucus sedge being used, is, may well be the predominant um, larval food plant of this endangered species in the UK. And it does get affected by you know, scrub encroachment um, as a result of a loss of traditional management practices. So knowing what your, your endangered moth is eating is, is a very useful thing to help with, with management for the future. Um, but there's probably more needs to be, to be understood um, about that. So um, the, the project also is, uh, the temperature project is also a lot about helping recorders and facilitating recorders um, in terms of increasing their knowledge, increasing the number of recorders, and we do that in a number of ways, including through lots of free or heavily subsidised training and, and helping out with the, with the local um, groups with their initiatives. So here's just um, some of the, um, not completely finalised yet, um, but here's some of the um, courses that we're running this year at Well Museum and, and some other places as well. We, we don't do very much on Lepidoptera. We don't do many serp, commission many surveys on Lepidoptera because you know, you, they get all the attention, don't they? So, um, but in, in terms of supporting local publications, we, we've, we've done a, a little bit of that and 
One of those um, was, was doing some, an online Atlas for Lancashire um, a few years ago, and that has really led on to, um, we, we agreed to then uh, take on helping out with um, an actual hard copy book um, with, with Ben and Steve, and I hadn't had any beers at that point before I agreed to, to do that. And so, um, if you want to find anything more about the Signature Project though, please just um, go to the website, all the events and stuff are on there. We do lots of recording days and all, all kinds of stuff. Um, but Justine's um, report on Lease Minor is there, as well as another uh, was an excellent survey that Ben did for us on Anacampsis, Anacampsis Temerella. Also found out new sort of biological information with that one. Um, and then, yeah, other, other than, yeah, just, just go on there and find out everything else about the um, Temperature Project. Oh yeah, also in the, in the entomologist record, um, there's an article, Justin's article's in there about the, about the larval finds. Can't remember its journal, Ben's is in, uh, about Anacampsis, but the, all that information is out there. So uh, that's it, I'll, I'll hand over to Ben now to go over the book, thank you. Good morning everyone um, and thanks very much Gary. Um, okay so today I'm going to talk about The Moths of Lancashire which is a, a book that Steve Palmer and I have been working on for the last three years and we're really excited to say that it's nearly here. Um, in Lancashire um, moth recording has really um, become pr you know hugely prevalent over the last sort of 30-40 years with the formation of the Lancashire Moth Group in 1995. Uh, with um, development of the CMR system, easily accessible internet resources, excellent and affordable field guides and cheap digital cameras, we've got a massive database of records and photographs now in the county, which made producing a book like this a realistic proposition. I wanted to talk about producing the book and how we did so. So to produce an accurate assessment of the states of all the Lancashire moths, we needed to maximise the number of records on the database spread the word to encourage all to send in their recent records plus any that have been sitting in their to-do pile um, and this encouragement was done via various forums facebook groups and stuff and there were also four book progress newsletters which appeared on the lancashire moth group website and also um, were emailed out to um, lancashire recorders and on the newsletters we had lists of under-recorded tetrads which is what you see here these were tetrads with less than 20 records and these were dotted throughout the county, so you know it, everybody had tetrads near them where they could go and contribute to um, getting a greater spread of records throughout the county. We also provided suggestions of under-recorded species, um, lists of moths that lacked adult photos, and lists of moths that lacked photos of larvae, because the intention was that we would also have a photograph of every moth and every larva. You know, for every species recorded in the county. We knew we weren't going to achieve that, but as close as we could get to it was what we were aiming for. And I must say as well, thanks very much to Carolyn Palmer, who um, compiled these lists and provided regular updates to them. Um, and massive thanks too to members of the Lancashire Moth Group and wider as well. Um, Steve Hind in particular did some wonderful work in southeast VC 59, crossing the border from Cheshire with many under recorded micros. Um, and in the end, we had over 2,000 recorders and approximately 150 photographers whose photos were used in the book. Um, meanwhile, Steve Palmer and I carried out many searches for under-recorded and unphotographed species. An example of this was Femoria weaveri, a leaf miner of Cowbury. Pretty uncommon plant in the county and one restricted to the fells. So you can only find it by, you know, a bit, needs a bit more effort to check it out. So in March 20, 2022, we headed up from Birkbank near Cluffer in the north of the county after avoiding the territorial red grouses. Um, we managed to locate the leaf mines and we were successful in breeding these through. So we had photos of the mines and the adults for the book and we subsequently found it in three tetrads, which you can see in the distribution map there in the top right hand corner, all up in the north of the county. Um, Lancashire. For those who don't know, everyone knows where Lancashire is, don't they? But just in case you don't, it's about halfway up the United Kingdom on the west coast of England, just north of Wales and Cheshire, um, south of Cumbria and to the west of Yorkshire. Um, 
as well as finding this leaf miner, we were successful in finding another species um, which was previously unrecorded in the county. And this feeds on the same food plant on, on Cowberry. And we found larvae of the tortoisid Ropebota ostromaculana and were successful in rearing this one through also. And also found it in three tetrads. So that was a really positive outcome. Um, here's a photo um, we've already seen. Um, as well as the least minor, which Gary's talked about, that we found here in Dalton Crags, North Lancashire. Um, we also managed to find um, a couple of different Elachista species. On the photograph here is Justine Patton. Justine is the um, County Moth Recorder for Macros and VC60. In the middle is Steve Palmer. Um, as I say, Steve couldn't be here today. Steve's a nearly naturalised Lancastrian, <laughs> <coughs> originally from Wiltshire spent time in Aberdeenshire and uh, no it's not he's originally from Hertfordshire <laughs> but spent time in Aberdeenshire and Wiltshire uh, and whilst in Wiltshire wrote a book The Micromoths of Wiltshire he moved to Lancashire in 1993 was a real um, leading force behind the setting up the Lancashire Moth Group he runs the Galekiad recording scheme and is currently the VC59 Micromoth recorder and that's me on the right. We were supposed to be looking for leaf, least minor, but I think at that point I was going off piste and looking for Elachista mines. Um, I'm, I am a Lancastrian, I'm from Rochdale, live in Manchester. Um, keen Micromoth recorder and photographer, and <coughs> produced two books of Micromoth field tips for the Lancashire and Cheshire Fauna Society. So on this site, well, I managed to find this leaf mine, which I hoped was Elachista triceriatella. I don't think the mines have been recorded in this country, although I could be wrong. Um, it's uh, believed to feed on sheep's fescue, Festuca ovina, which this was feeding on. Um, through the Tenyptera Trust, we were able to access some um, DNA barcoding. Unfortunately, this one tenanted mine was, was parasitised, and even more unfortunately, it turned out to be Elachista canapinella, which meant that we were lack, lacking a photo of the species, of any stage of the species for the book. So the three of us went back in July, and we were there at six o'clock in the morning checking um, five traps that had been left overnight. And this time we were, we were successful. We managed to find seven um, examples of Triceriatella, um, plus plenty more being kicked up from the grass is early in the morning. Um, so that's great. So we've got a photo of Triceriatella now for the book. Um, another one that's found in the north of the county. And, um, but still need to find the leaf mine, maybe next year. Okay. Um, so in producing the book, we needed to go back and look at the historical records. It's a very dry but essential part of the early preparation. We looked at the early texts. Um, Gregson in 1857 was a crucial text looking at um, butterflies and moths that were <coughs> recorded in the Liverpool district. Um, the first county guide or first county list actually covering Lancashire and Cheshire plus um, much of what is now South Cumbria was produced by John Ellis in 1890 and was updated by Mansbridge in 1940 and those three texts are essential for us. They contain loads of records. Um, you know, with locations listed and have a good coverage really of micro moths as well as macro moths. Other sources were journals produced by local entomology societies, by the Lancashire and Cheshire Entomological Society and the Lancashire and Cheshire Fauna Society, 19th century journals such as the Entomologist and Zoologist, and obviously um, current journals such as the, the Entomologist Gazette and the Entomologist Record wasn't always easy to ascertain the accuracy of some of these early records and one that we reluctantly decided we couldn't include was the Kentish glory. As an interesting aside, this was noted in one of these journals, the Entomologist Weekly Intelligencer, in 1856 in an article entitled Economy of Micropteryx and Argyrestia brochiella. Charles Gregson wrote of um, a trip to a wood near Preston, he attended there with J.P. Hodgkinson and W. Ashworth in the middle of the piece, in quite dramatic prose, he stated, saw a moth on the wing, which I was afraid to name. Not being satisfied about it, I went back from Preston next day. The sun being overclouded for a short time, had the pleasure of seeing Andromis versicola, 
Kentish glory, sitting at the end of a birch bough, a fine male. He then goes off to discuss the weather and the two species that were mentioned in the title. Now, this would be a remarkable record, not, you know, not known, no other Lancashire records are from the counties around it either. Um, and reluctantly, we couldn't confirm it. So we also, we do have a section in the book um, for these unconfirmed records. I mean, he didn't tell his colleagues about it. There's no specimen. Neither Ellis or Mansbridge mentioned it. So we looked on the air. We had to, we had to leave that one out. We also visited various museums to um, compile records. So we went to Manchester Museum, um, which was, you know, really helpful curators, um, Diana and Dimitri. They've got some great collections there. We made lots of records, plenty of species that um, certainly we didn't have photographs of, but some species that otherwise were unrecorded. The star of the show, of course, being um, Euclemensia woodyella, the Manchester moth, which actually is the first um, record we have of a moth recorded in Lancashire. It was recorded in 1829. Um, a really interesting story from the early days of entomology, um, when this moth was recorded at Curzel Moor, actually in Salford, not in Manchester. Um, the species was named, well, the species was discovered by Robert Cribb, but it ended up being named after a factory employer, R. Wood, and in disgust, Robert Cribb gave up entomology, and later most of the specimens that he'd collected were thrown onto the fire by the landlady at Cribb's regular public house due to unpaid bills. But three specimens survive, one's in Australia, one's in the Natural History Museum, and this one here's in Manchester Museum. And actually the species was never found again anywhere in the UK anywhere until 2013 when it turned up in Austin, Texas. And it's thought that it was accidentally introduced to Salford via imported timber on the Manchester Ship Canal. Whilst there we yeah, got some photos of some of the um, rarely recorded moths of the county where we knew we weren't likely to get a photograph of a live specimen, so set specimens were used. Um, I think really Gary's already mentioned, obviously with the Tanitra Trust, the, the great part that Liverpool Museum played in the production of this book also. Um, in particular, um, Steve Judd and certainly Gary provided massive support to Steve and I throughout the project. These photographs were taken by Richard Walker, beautiful photographs on the advanced camera setup that they have at Liverpool Museum. Um, those couple on the bottom are over 120 years old, um, such fresh specimens. Um, yeah, so thanks very much to Richard for taking those photos and allowing us to include them within the book. A further museum check was done at Bolton Museum. Two, spe two species included in the book that, that we hope to photograph. We only have one record in the county of the Spurge hawk moth, a one of um, the par Parapoinix bilinealis, which is one of the China mark moths. Um, both have been recorded in the Bolton area, but the, the specimens were not there. We ended up just with Heliozella sericiella. The only reason I've included this is just shows what, what great help we've had from curators. We, we didn't, uh, this is another we didn't have a photograph of. This was labelled as sericiella, but as, as many of us might know, it's not something you really can identify unless it's been bred, which it wasn't, or unless it's been dissected, and this was an un undissected specimen. So um, Lauren Field, who's a natural history curator at Bolton, took the moth via public transport from Bolton all the way up to Preston for Steve Palmer to dissect it. Um, just that was a really great example of the support that we've had. So, what have we ended up with? In the book itself, we've got an excellent habitats chapter which is written by Steve Garland, a well-respected local naturalist and former CMR in which he looks at the wide range of important habitats that we have in Lancashire and the typical moth species that are associated with them. The bulk of the book, though, is taken up with species accounts, 1,560 of them, one for every species ever recorded in Lancashire prior to 2023. Here's an example showing all the components, the emperor moth. Beautiful photos here um, by Trevor Davenport, who I'm really sad to say passed away a few weeks, just a few weeks ago. But Trevor's been a massive um, help to us and provided some fantastic photos. Um, but as an example, this shows, we, we've got this sort of layout for every species. So we've got the status, we've got the date range where it's been recorded in Lancashire. 
some more information on how it's been found in Lancashire. We've got the habitats. So for each species, we've got the habitats where it's known in the county. And what is the first, we've also got the food plants. These food plants only relate to findings within our county. So within Lancashire, Emperor larvae have been found on heather, bilberry, birch and bramble. And on the right, we've got the distribution map and we've got a phenology graph. And many thanks again to Gary, the Tenipture Trust, um, for compiling these graphs and um, maps. The same applies to micromoths. This is a pretty rarely recorded micromoth, Phylinerictus caporiella, which was recorded in 2022 when it was bred from Broome on the Sefton coast. And that was only the fourth record for the county. Now, as this species has never been recorded flying in the adult stage, we don't have a phenology graph. I should say the phenology, the phenology graphs um, apply to adult records only. I mean, it's cold down here. <laughs> Most pages contain three of these species accounts, as with the page on the right. And that on the left reviews one of the special species of the county, in this case, the grass egger. And I'm really grateful to Graham Jones for compiling this one. We had um, 17 species that we felt were really deserving of their own page with extended text and more photographs and guest authors with a special interest in the particular species have written 13 of these 17 single page species accounts. Um, so an example of another page. This one is mainly of the swift moths with yet yeah, photographs by many different um, moth recorders within and, and outside of the county as well, actually. Um, and another page showing some of the micros and I suppose illustrating the importance of early stages recording as all those adult photos were only obtained by first finding the leaf mines. So we've got some Neptuculids there on the left and a couple of Elachista species there on the right. So after all this and nearing three years later, because we started in early 2021, we had a, a couple of years of field work followed by a solid year of writing. We're finally nearing completion, I'm glad to see. And here is the book. The Moths of Lancashire, with a fantastic photo of one of the county's most important species, the Belted Beauty, which was photographed by Jack Morris. Many thanks to Jack. Um, and the book should be available, all being well, from late April or May this year. It's published by Pisces Publications. It's a hardback book, 672 pages long, full colour throughout, with over 2,500 photos. Um, it's available for pre-order if anyone wants. Bargain price of twenty nine ninety five if ordered before the start of May. Um, and if anyway, if anyone wishes to pre-order the book or chat to me or Gary about any aspects of it, feel free at any point today. There's some leaflets around which you may have seen advertising the book and with all the information regarding it and the pre-publication info. Um, so, yeah, once more, I must say thanks to Gary and the Tenipture Trust for all their support throughout the project. Also, thanks to Butterfly Conservation and to the conference for allowing us to speak here today. So I'm going to talk about um, conserving the UK's most threatened moths, um, recording, there's sort of three parts to it, recording, monitoring and research. Um, so we've got the Barbary carpet moth there, and um, that's the caterpillar, and also the forester. Um, I think the last time I spoke here was 2015 on extreme mothing, so this one's a bit less extreme and um, still hopefully of interest and I'll hopefully keep you awake for another 25 minutes. So I'm in the ecology team at Butterfly Conservation. Um, we're quite a recently sort of expanded team. Um, we've got a head of ecology, Caroline Bowman, who's here today, and also five ecologists now working in various places around the UK. Um, so we're separate from the recording and monitoring team in BC and also the research and conservation teams, but obviously we work closely with all of them. And the difference with our team really is that we're focused mainly on the, on the priority species um, to enable conservation work on those. So we're really supporting the conservation work of the conservation team by providing the background knowledge and information they need. And we're supported by a grant from Natural England. Um, and yes, as I said, the survey work, monitoring and research, which I'll, I'll come on to discuss. So why the need for this work? Why not just go out and do the habitat management? Um, 
Well, it's kind of obvious, I guess, that we need to understand the status of species. Before we can do that work, we need to know which are the most threatened, which are the ones we need to prioritise for, for that kind of work, because budgets are limited and we can't just go out there and do everything we'd like to do. So we need to prioritise things. Uh, it also allows us to evaluate the impacts of things that are ongoing, like climate change, where things are changing all the time. So there's always a need to kind of re revisit species where we've already done work. Um, and understanding the actual basic ecology, like Ben was talking about with the, um, and Gary with the um, least minor, and um, things like the belt of beauty, that's really important for um, understanding, you know, how to go about and conserve those species. Um, for butterflies, we generally know that information pretty well, although things are changing a bit with climate change. But for moths, even though this has been studied for generations, um, there's still, still quite a few gaps, partly because there's so many moths in the UK that not all of them have been studied in detail. And also things are changing, so species that might once have been single brooded might now be double brooded because the climate's warming up and that kind of thing. Uh, for some of them, we don't even know what the key food plants are, so even some of the rarer species that have been well kind of monitored for quite a long time, like, say, black-veined moth in Kent, uh, it's quite hard to find the caterpillars of that, um, so it's, you have to go out at night, and even then they're often not feeding, so trying to find the key food plants for that species is, is quite challenging, so we still don't really know all of the key food plants for that species. And we don't always know the phenology of the different life stages either. Uh, and this will obviously underpin effective conservation work uh, once we know this information. And just to say, this kind of fits into butterfly conservation's current strategy. There's a goal one in that, which is um, to half the number of threatened species in the UK. So obviously this work underpins that as well. So in terms of recording and monitoring and population trends, um, this is from the State of Moths, um, State of Britain's Larger Moths report from 2021. Um, those graphs on the left show the trends for abundance from the Rothamsted light trap data and for a distribution from the National Moth Recording Scheme, where all your records go. And we've got trends for uh, just over 500 species for long-term distribution trends from the National Moth Recording Scheme and just over 400 species, largely within that 500 for the Rothamsted light trap data. So you can imagine when there's about maybe 800 uh, macro moths in the UK that are resident, this leaves maybe 300 of the scarcer species which don't have that trend data. Um, and these are pretty much always the scarcer species and the reason for that is they don't have as much data in the National Moth Recording Scheme and the Rothamsted Scheme to, to generate trends. There's generally gaps in the records. And also the small matter of maybe 1,500 or so micro moths which we don't have that trend data for as well. So we can get an idea from, say, the maps from the 2019 Moth Atlas. So you can see there for large red-belted clearwing, um, it looks quite bad for that species, the black dots being the post-2000 records and the, the yellow and blue ones, the earlier sort of pre-2000 records. So you can see it looks like it's massively declined, especially in the Midlands of England, um, around this part of the world. Um, but when we look at the, the trend data, there's, there's nothing there for that species because just due to a relative lack of data, it wasn't possible to generate meaningful, robust trends for that species. So this is the kind of thing we're looking to address to get better data for these species. Um, in terms of recording threatened moths, at a basic level, we need to understand their, their status across the UK. So as a team, we're generally going out and surveying species at known sites. Depending on the level of threat and how easy they are to survey, that might be once every five years or it might be once every year for species that are only on just a few sites. Um, we're also trying to get to former sites to see if species are still there, if the habitat's still there, and also potential sites that have got breeding habitat but maybe haven't been looked at before. Um, for each site visit, we're generally recording habitat and management information uh, while we're there, as well as um, looking for the species itself. So just an example on the recording side, we do do some monitoring for this species as well, but I'm only going to talk a bit about the, the sort of just general recording for this today. Lampronia capitella, the current shoot borer. There's a lovely photo by Patrick Clement there. Um, the caterpillars um, are easier in a way to survey than the adults because they live in the, the shoot tips of red currants and, and maybe black currants as well, usually in damp woodlands in the spring, and they cause this wilting that you can see on that photo there of the shoots. It's a very short season for surveying these, maybe just two or three weeks um, when you can find these wilted shoots in April. Um, and then you can open those shoot tips up and you can see the caterpillar there just kind of in the middle, which is a kind of a characteristic uh, species. I don't think there's anything you can mix that up with. 
but we don't open all the shoot tips up because that would be kind of an un unfair level of disturbance for the species really so we'd only look at a, a few just to make sure that we are actually seeing that and it is the right thing that's causing that. Um, up to 2022 we only knew of three breeding sites in the UK for that species really well scattered so there was one in there's one in the Scottish borders uh, there's one in the wire forest and one in Surrey um, there were some other sites with adult records but didn't necessarily have breeding habitat so they maybe were species where it was maybe individuals that wandered in from elsewhere or maybe older records um, so we did quite a lot of targeted surveys across the last couple of years to visit old sites and to visit potential new sites and this has been a mixture of BC staff and volunteers and also other moth recorders and actually it's been really positive for this species we found seven new breeding sites in the last nearly all last year um, a couple in Somerset, a few in Wiltshire and then some in Norfolk as well so we now know of 10 species sites where this species breeds uh, rather than three so that's a big big improvement in our knowledge but it doesn't seem to be everywhere there's some sites that have got lots of currents but people haven't been able to find it so it does seem to be more patchy than the food plant. So in terms of monitoring um, as I said before the Rothamsted insect survey with the light trap there uh, that generates the records for the commoner species with light trapping every every night of the year um, but for the rarer ones we just don't get enough data from that type of trap which isn't targeting the rare species so we do need this bespoke monitoring for those in the form of kind of standardized annual counts that's what I mean by by monitoring rather than just surveying or surveillance so since 2000 we've got data for around 14 species of macro and micro moth of some of these rarer species which go into this government indicator of priority species so that was started by Mark Parsons when he was at butterfly conservation and um, this this could be across the life history stages so it's not necessarily adults or, or larvae although they usually are one of those two we don't I don't think there's any species monitored as pupae but um, fire clearing that's monitored by counting the eggs on dock stems in the southeast corner in Kent these little black eggs on the dock uh, netted carpet in the Lake District is monitored by counting the, the caterpillars on its on its sole flute pan and touch me not balsam and bright wave is monitored more like butterflies by adult counts either time counts or transects down in um, the southeast corner of England and we need to expand this monitoring to more species because 14 out of those few hundred which haven't got trends is is really not as many as we would like um, some of them are never going to be possible to monitor because they're just too hard to find and get good count data for but there are some which definitely are um, so in 2020 we went through and sort of assessed all the priority species and which ones might be suitable for monitoring um, and we we kind of concluded that about 40 additional species were going to be suitable or should be suitable in the in the shorter term there might be some others that are more of a long-term investment where we need to understand their ecology more first so this this larval case Deropteryx fusca I'm not sure what the new um, English name is for that it used to be brown sweep which was, wasn't the best name to be honest I don't think but I'm not sure what it is now uh, it makes this quite distinctive case but it's a very rare species on bogs just in in a kind of wixel moss kind of area um, and then also in the in the northwest but we can you can go along on the bog and say do a transect and count the number of cases of that on the vegetation um, monitoring for the scarce moths as I said has been considered but some of them are just too difficult to get good count data for they're just generally they're just not detectable enough so you could spend all day finding say one caterpillar so to get a meaningful count every year you'd have to go several days a year and it's just not really feasible for someone to do that for every single species and in terms of survey methods as I said we already use quite a few and there's lots of other possibilities um, so there's transex time counts of adults uh, counts of caterpillars which can take the form of directly counting the larvae or it could be larval cases like that Steropteryx fusca or counting spinnings on the food plant uh, you can do larval beating um, which obviously is a level of disturbance because you're dislodging them from the food plant and so and you have to put them back so you wouldn't want to do that too widely and also sweeping which can be for larvae or adults and then there's there's adult lures like light trapping and pheromones but we don't really use these for annual monitoring counts because it's just really hard to get good data the light, light trap catches as you know vary so much night to night you'd have to go so many times to get good count data and generally with these rare species on kind of usually on nature reserves it's not easy to go and do that and similar with pheromones it's very hard to standardize it varies so much with the weather so there's an example of one where we can look for spinnings 
the Argent Sable, um, so there it is on bog myrtle and it makes this spinning at the shoot tip and you can gently peel back some of the leaves and see the caterpillar which is quite distinctive because some of the micro moths and powdered quaker and a few other things also make spinnings on, on bog myrtle so you've got to be a bit careful with the ID. So again you wouldn't want to open all these spinnings up because that would be too much disturbance so you'd only do a proportion of the ones that you find. Uh, and some species needed method trials as well which I'll come back to. So in terms of progress with that across the last four years um, we've got four existing uh, data sets that were already out there <coughs> excuse me but we didn't have them in the database um, so these have been added in. So there was Slender Scotch Burnet in the west coast of Scotland, um, nine sites from 1995 onwards with adult time counts. Uh, this is work that's been led by National Trust Scotland. <coughs> uh, New Forest Burnet, another rare one in Scotland on the west coast from at its sole site, there's data from 1998. Uh, the Forester has been monitored from 2013 at a site in Durham using time counts. We've now expanded that to a few more sites in the last couple of years. And Rosy Marsh Moth, which from one site in Wales have had, has had larval counts done by Natural Resources Wales since 1988. So a really good long data set for that. The caterpillar is very distinctive, as you can see there. This one's on bog rosemary, but it's usually on bog myrtle at the site where the monitoring is done, cause, um, cause Vocno. Um, and again, it's, it's only one site, but there's only three or four sites in the UK for that species anyway. <coughs> And we've also done trials for 15 species, many of these in Scotland. Um, 10 of these I would say have been successful and the other five, it turned out they really weren't that easy to get good count data for. They're either just too hard to find or the other problem is with some of the micros, just, the numbers just depend so much on the activity and that seems to be really weather dependent. So you might go one day and see a lot of these things flying and go the next day in very slightly different weather, even though the weather still seems quite good and there'll be hardly any activity. So it's just sometimes really hard to get meaningful counts. So they're suitable for survey, but not really monitoring. But the ones that have worked um, really well, some of them, so Mountain Burnet, another rare burnet in Scotland, but this time a montane species that's now monitored in the Cairngorms, sort of in montane heath habitat with adult counts. Uh, another Scottish one, the Afric Twitcher or Charutis diana in Glen Afric. Um, these make these larval spinnings on birch. Why it's so rare when it's only on birch is, is a bit of a mystery, really. Uh, and then marsh carpet in East Anglia. So this has got a, quite a nice distinctive caterpillar on meadow rue, but it's quite hard to find, I think. But we can get larval counts for that. And then one where we look for spinnings is uh, the greenweed flat body, Agonoptrix atomella. Um, I now do counts at a couple of sites in Wales for that species on dyes greenweed. Uh, so we've now got 40 species in the programme, which I'm quite, uh, well, I was really impressed with that when we put the data together. I would, I'm not going to read all those out because it's too many, but that's the 40 species there. So this is a mix of those established species and then some new species, including Luna Yellow and doing in the kind of Brex area where uh, Sharon and other people go out at night and look for the distinctive caterpillars in the winter with a torch. Um, many of these species still only have short data runs and uh, just a few sites. So the main priority now is to scale this up to more, more sites really for some of these species because we could keep adding in more species but we wouldn't really be doing a lot of them justice then. We really need to get more, a bigger sample size for those that are in there. And we're also producing a manual of the methods so we can hopefully then send that out to people who want to take this up. Uh, and this is the output you really get from this monitoring work. This is produced by Emily Dennis, BC's um, statistician. So these are some of the species with longer data runs. And you can see, you can't really read the species there, but we'll highlight a couple of them. But you can see some are, some are stable, some are increasing, some are declining. So one that's doing quite well is Silky Wave. Uh, this is monitored at the Avon Gorge site and at the sites in Wales. Um, and that seems to be doing pretty well over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, one where it looks a lot worse is um, Sussex Emerald um, in Dungeness, where it looks like it's really declined heavily there. And I think that's due to um, its larval counts and, the, and the, the problem there seems to be largely rabbits eating the wild carrot food plant. Um, but actually, the more positive story for this species is it's been expanding in that southeast corner and is now found in Sussex. And it's been recorded in um, a few other counties as well in um, Suffolk and in Essex. So it might be looking to expand from its previous strongholds in Dungeness. Right, the last bit of the talk is, is a bit about research, actual going out and researching the life histories. 
uh, of these species. So I'm going to focus on one of my favourite micro moths, Anania fenebris, the white spotted sable, which is a stunning moth, but often quite hard to see, even though it's um, brightly coloured. It tends to hide away under leaves a lot. Um, it's a priority species and has been for quite a long time. Um, you can see the black squares there are the more recent post-2000 records. You can see quite a lot of grey squares where it used to occur and um, where it doesn't seem to have been seen for a long time. Um, so the main strongholds now are the south and west coast of Wales, where there's quite a few sites, but mostly small numbers. Um, down in the southeast corner, mainly in Kent, uh, around Morecambe Bay in Lancashire, and then up in western Scotland. And we know the food plant for that species, there's only one, that's goldenrod, the native goldenrod. Um, and it tends to be on places like that top photo there is a site near me in South Wales, which is a kind of bracken slope. And you see the yellow goldenrod flowering there in late summer. And then the bottom site is at the, the Bleen in Kent, where it's growing in a slightly different habitat among um, regrowth of coppice. Um, you can see, you can just about see the yellow of the goldenrod in there as well. Um, so we understand the, the food plant, we know the habitat's reasonably well and a reasonable good idea of its distribution, although there's probably a few other sites within those areas that we don't know. Um, but the life cycle is uh, a bit of a puzzle because in recent years we've been looking for caterpillars and finding quite big caterpillars in, in um, June, say, but there's also records of caterpillars right through until sort of October time. Um, the adults fly in the spring or late spring and so the larvae feeding after that. Um, and it's supposed to be single brooded according to the books, largely single brooded anyway, although I think the books say it's double brooded in the Burren in Ireland. Um, but the fact we're finding really big caterpillars so early in the year made us think that it's probably going to be at least partially double brooded. Um, we also needed to get a better understanding of host plant use, which type of plants it prefers. So last year we had a coordinated programme within BC of surveys across the UK. Uh, including Western Scotland, South Wales, Cumbria and Kent. Looked at 13 sites in detail. This is one of the nice sites in Argyle. And that's the caterpillar. They live under the lower leaves of the plant and you, you can find the holes in the leaves and turn them over and you find these caterpillars just stretched out. Luckily they tend to stay put and they don't tend to fall off when you, when you turn the leaf over. So you can count them. And so we can gather information on the host plant characteristics, uh, the size of the caterpillars and the feeding location. And I did some repeated surveys at two sites near me in Glamorgan every three to four weeks through the season to investigate the phenology. So in total, we found 143 caterpillars, which I think is really good. I don't think you'd ever see that many adults at those sites. Um, they're generally easy to find an adult moth once you know what to look for. Uh, they're nearly all under the lower leaves, um, usually a bit tucked in among other vegetation, sometimes really tucked in among brambles and things. Um, only seven larvae were found on the kind of upper leaves of the plant on the flowering spike, which is quite tall, and none in the flowers, even though the books say that they do sometimes feed in the flowers, but we didn't see any evidence of that. Uh, they usually like these partially shaded host plants, so there's a good example. The plant there is slightly tucked away to the left under the bracken. But it's a warm sort of a warm site with, you know, it's by this path, it's quite tucked in, nice and sunny, but the plant itself's got a bit of shading, which might be important for the caterpillars. Uh, maybe it's important for the plant to stop droughting, I don't know, but you do tend to find them on those kind of semi-shaded sort of plants. And then this is kind of new information, just only put this together this week, but just had a look at these, this data for these two sites near me. Um, and it seems to show quite clearly that it's double brooded, at least in, in my area of South Wales. Um, the, the larval counts increased to a peak of around 25 uh, this was looking at the same areas each time, so exactly the same search areas. So it seemed to peak in kind of early July and then again in September with a big dip in caterpillar numbers in between. And then I saw adults in small numbers right at the start of the season and then in between these two caterpillar peaks, so that also fits quite nicely with that. So it does seem to be, at least in 2023, fully double brooded in South Wales, at least in this part of South Wales where I was. Um, and... Is that typical? I don't know. It seems to be double rooted in Kent as well, and um, it maybe this is quite a recent thing because the weather's got warmer. We did have a record break in June last year, and that might have triggered more of a, a strong second generation. But we do have some data from the previous couple of years finding quite big larvae again in, in sort of mid late June. So I think it probably is the norm now, but maybe it wasn't 20 years ago. 
In Northern England, it seems to be largely single brooded with a possible partial second brood and maybe the same in North Wales. In Scotland, there's not many caterpillars being found, but it seems likely to be single brooded there too. So what's the significance of this work? Well, it enables us to better target surveys. So we, can, we know the timing to go and look for them for one thing, and we can look for larvae rather than adults. So that's making, making the surveys more efficient, really. Um, we know where larvae are on site. So then if you're doing, say, management work, if you've got to cut back an area, cut back some golden rod by a path, which happened at one of the whale sites, that could be done at time of year when, it's, when the caterpillars aren't going to be there. Um, and also we need to, I haven't looked at this data yet, but we've got data on the sort of habitat structure around the plants that are used. So we, we should have a better idea of the type of habitat it prefers. And also golden rod is really good for a whole load of scarce moths. So um, not all of these are going to be on every site, but there's a load of nationally rare and scarce, particularly micro moths on, on golden rod. Uh, I've just highlighted two there that I see on my surveys around my area. So the, um, the starwort, I actually see it on different sites to the Anania phenibris, but there's probably some overlap. Um, it's a nice big caterpillar. And then the much more hairy caterpillar of the, the plain plume, Helincia tephrodactyla, which does very similar things to the Anania phenibris caterpillars. It's under the lower leaves and it makes these kind of feeding windows late in the year. Um, so yeah, if you, do, if you manage to have sites for golden rod, you're going to benefit some of these other species as well. And we've also got golden rod fact sheet on the BC website if anyone's interested. So just in summary, um, we're making good progress in recording and monitoring um, and understanding ecology, but obviously there's still a lot to learn and the process would never be complete because things are always changing, um, with climate change particularly. Um, we're, we always welcome more volunteers to help with recording and monitoring these species and doing this ecological work. So do um, get in touch if you'd like to get involved. And just to say thanks to the, to the BC staff who've helped particularly with the Anani Phenibus work, Ryan Clark, David Hill and Rebecca Levy. Uh, Patrick Cook's done a lot of the moth monitoring in Scotland and Emily Dennis has done all the nice statistics on the data. Also to the BC volunteers, I think I've credited all the photographers uh, whose photos weren't mine. Uh, all the moth recorders who submit data and then the funders as well. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you very much. And if, yeah, if anyone wants to stand up and wiggle around a little bit, do feel free. I'm going to keep my coat on. <laughs> I hope that's OK. Um, but yeah, I'm Charlie. I'm a researcher at UCL. And throughout my research career so far, I've very much been focused on large scale insect biodiversity change. Um, and more recently, very much become interested in moth recording as well. So I'd be very happy to get some tips on that um, afterwards if anyone would like to chat with me. Um, but yes, I sit within the Centre for Biodiversity and Environment Research at UCL. Um, we've got a lot of researchers interested in lots of different things, but there's a few of us that are very much interested in insect biodiversity change and how these things are changing at very large scales. So that's what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today. So insect biodiversity change has very much become quite big in the news over recent years. We've seen some massive headlines about an insect apocalypse, an insect ageddon, all these big headlines telling us that you know everything's dying and it's very dire and, and honestly quite depressing a lot of the time. And these headlines really came about in the publish in publication of these uh, main papers back in 2017 and 2018, which so showed some quite dramatic declines in much of, uh, or in some of our insect um, biodiversity in certain parts of the world. And as a result of some of these papers, even though people have been studying insects for a very long time and thinking about large scale changes, the publication of insect decline papers has really dramatically risen after this kind of 2017, 2018 period. If I can get this thing going here. So you can see this nicer uh, steep increase. And I think this is great. People are really interested in insects now. The amount of research being done is growing and growing and we're learning a lot more about what is happening to insects at really large scales. And this is important because, as we know, insects are threatened by a lot of things. And a lot of these things are driven by us people. So we've got pollution, invasive species, agricultural intensification, all the way through to climate change and changes um, in the weather patterns and broader climate as well. So it's really important that we understand at large scales what's happening to insects because all of these pressures are on insects all over the world, not just locally, but across large scales as well. 
And so myself and others have been really interested in thinking about, you know, what about the little guys? When we monitor biodiversity, we have these things that we call biodiversity indicators. And often it's a lot, a lot, a lot of information crammed into one line that essentially says, how are things doing? Are they going up or are they going down? And so the Living Planet Index is this one that I've got here. This is an indicator showing that the abundance of vertebrates has reduced by about 69% since 1970. A massive decline. But the key word there, I guess, is vertebrates. This is only focusing on mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, um, and fish. So we don't really know a lot at the large scale, or we didn't really know a lot about insects at large scales. And similarly at the UK, we also have indicators that we use to monitor progress for biodiversity change in the UK. So we have these UK biodiversity indicators, which are published every year. But it was the case that most of these indicators were focused on things that we have a lot of data for. So things like the butterflies, everyone loves them. Um, and we've got some things on some mammals and obviously the birds. The birds are very popular. But again, what about the little guys? We didn't have a lot of information for most of the species on how they were doing in terms of trends over time. So my PhD was trying to look into this and trying to say what's happening to the UK's understudied species in terms of these trends over time. So I was based at UKCEH, who we know um, housed the Biological Record Centre and work with a lot of recording schemes to um, collect and maintain databases of um, monitoring data, which is fantastic. But uh, there is obviously a, a quite a big difference between a lot of the data sets that they have available that have been collected primarily by volunteers like you guys. Thank you very much. So we have the structured monitoring data and then we have the more unstructured monitoring data. So on the structured side, this is brilliant. We have protocols for collection. We have predetermined sites and we can collect abundance data. So we can reduce the amount of bias that is in our data by providing these well set out methods. And we can collect information on the number of individuals of different species, so nice fine grained information. On the other side, we have the unstructured data, which we are able to get for many, many more species. So structured stuff is great, but it doesn't cover everything. So luckily, the UK has this amazing resource in that we have all of this unstructured monitoring data. But it can be tricky because of the fact there's no protocols, site selection is quite ad hoc, and it is presence only data in a lot of cases. But luckily, there are things that we can do with that. So through my PhD, I worked to develop some, this is all you're going to get on stats, some scary <laughs> statistical models. <laughs> Nobody likes to hear about those, so we'll keep that quiet. So essentially, we were, were able to develop these models that could um, better account for some of the biases in this data so that we could analyse many, many more species than we were able to do before. So I was able to run these models for over 5,000 species, mostly insects, but also for things like uh, mosses and lichens as well, covering 31 taxonomic groups. And for some groups, this is very easy. I could throw the data into a computer, run the models, and it would only take a few hours or a couple of days. For the moths and for some other groups where there is a lot more data, it took up to three months to run all the models for that group. Quite frustrating when you figure out something's gone wrong and you have to start it all over again. <laughs> and it wasn't just one time I had to do that. <laughs> but in the end, what we can get are trends for individual species. And we were able to get this for, from 1970 to 2015 that give us annual estimates of the occupancy of these species. And occupancy is kind of like a measure of distribution where we look at the proportion of sites occupied from those that we were able to analyze. And so out of these models, hopefully this is going to work. This should be a video. Is it going to? Oh, yes, it's started working. <laughs> So I've created a website where people can look at these um, trends. So essentially, we've got a drop-down menu. You can select the species uh, or the group and then the species that you're interested in. If you want to have a look at yourself, you should be able to just scan this code. Um, but essentially, it's presenting all the outputs for these 5,000-odd species if you wanted to take a look. The top graph shows the occupancy. This bottom one is a bit messier, but that shows changes in detection over time. And that gives us a sense of how um, easier or harder it has been to find things over the course of this, um, this recording period. And I think this is really useful because, amazingly, now we can have annual estimates of how we think things are doing for different species, and we can see some things have gone up and some things have gone down. That will come up again at the end if you, if you want to see that. 
So we're able to get these estimates for individual species. That's, of course, quite hard to interpret when we've got 5,000 graphs. So we aggregated some of the information into these um, indicators. So we had plots for each taxonomic group, and I've selected the moths here, of course. Um, and we can see it's a bit of a boring line, actually. <laughs> but as boring lines go, I guess it's a more positive one because it's pretty flat or a, a slight increase here. So compared to 1970, we can say that the occupancy of species has on average increased by about 9%. Um, and my data are a bit old now, so it only goes up to 2015. Um, I think people at CH have been rerunning these things to get some more, uh, more recent trends as well. And then we can take this up a little bit higher so we can aggregate things a little bit more and we can start to see some different patterns across some of the species that we looked at. So here I've aggregated things into four different groups, those 5,000 species again, but in the green we've got line, a line for 3,000-ish insects, so they had a bit of an increase, stable and then a more recent decline. In the purple, we've got the mosses and lichens, which look like they've been doing pretty well over recent years in terms of their um, occupancy, at least. We have some other invertebrates in blue, so we've got spiders, millipedes and centipedes, things in there. But then most interestingly was what came out was from the freshwater group. So this U-shaped trend is mainly driven by the river flies, but we do have some dragonflies um, and mollusks in there as well. But it's quite an interesting trend, so it shows a kind of steep decline up to the mid-90s, followed by this recovery and then plateau. And at the time, this was a little bit like, oh, this is weird. We're not, we normally see ups and downs or straight lines, but it's, we don't really often see this quite stark U-shaped trend. So we had a little bit of a think about what this could be, uh, what could be causing this. And we found out that in the mid-90s is actually when the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive was really being put into, into force. So it's quite possible that this recovery that we see here is driven by legislation. And more studies since have come out that kind of support this and have also seen uh, recent increases and also recent plateaus as well. So reassuring on the one hand, <laughs> it wasn't just me. <laughs> so that's really, uh, really interesting. But also... Why, has it, why have things stopped, I think, is, is the next interesting question that we're looking into for this group. But importantly, not all groups are changing in the same way. There are different things happening for different species. So that leads us to kind of think about different drivers. What could be driving these patterns of trends for those species? So this work was really exciting, especially for me as a PhD student, to be able to kind of come up with some exciting results. But it showed that we can use these scary models to get annual estimates of species occupancy from this kind of messy, unstructured data, and for many more species than we were able to before with these new methods. And like I said, not everything responds in the same way, and we were able to reveal previously unknown trends. And I was able to contribute these trends to the UK State of Nature report, which comes out every three years. And they did have an indicator on species distribution kind of change um, before these models. And I think they had about 1,000 species in there. But after we were able to do this research, that went up to 6,500 ish. So we're really able to boost the coverage in terms of, uh, of taxa that, that this indicator represented. And then after my PhD, I moved to UCL, and that's when I discovered moths. So I thought I'd intersperse the science with some fun, fun pictures. Um, so our master's students at UCL go to Blakeney Point on the Norfolk coast for their field trip at the beginning of their, their course to get to know each other, get outside, um, and see some wildlife. And we run moth traps there. So I was there with uh, Tim Blackburn and Tim Newbold, who some of you may know, both very keen mothers in this very beautiful setting. And we put the moth traps out every night and I gradually got to see all this amazing wildlife. And, and one day in particular, we kind of three of us bent round the trap, looked in and we all just stepped back and <gasps> gasped. And obviously Tim and Tim were looking in and gasping because they knew what they were looking at. They were looking at quite a rare species. I gasped because I was just like, Oh my God, that's huge. <laughs> I didn't even know we had insects that big in the UK. Um, and I was quite nervous when I was holding it there as well. But um, I think that was really 
a turning point for me, going from insects are data and yeah, it's really cool and we find some interesting trends to being insects are actually real things and I can go out and find them um, and get excited about it that way and probably care a little bit more about what, what the trends are showing there as well. So we've had pretty great time um, taking the students there, or the staff at least. <laughs> we don't get as many students getting up at 7am to check the trap, but we, we do try. And now we've got um, the new UCL East campus in Stratford. So we've got two new buildings over there that have been built right on the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. So when I found out there were some funds available that we could buy some moth traps, I was like, can we buy some, please? Um, then we started trapping regularly at the UCL East campus as well. And this hasn't been, I guess, as great on, in some respects um, as Blakeney Point, of course, because we're in a very built-up area. And actually, in, in terms of numbers of, of individuals, we haven't been getting that much at all, even compared to other people that are trapping in London. But we have had some, some beauties, including this amazing... Dorset cream wave that we caught in, um, in August, I believe it was, that actually turned out to be the eighth record for Britain. Um, so that again was kind of like, oh, that's an interesting one. I don't know what that is. And then <laughs> Tim Blackburn going like, oh, where's the book? <laughs> Flicking through the pages. I'm like, what's all the excitement about? <laughs> and then we start Googling, trying to figure out how many records there have been. So yeah, it's, been, it's quite enjoyable being the naive <laughs> person learning because you get caught up in everyone else's excitement. Um, but yeah, we set up three traps uh, on the rooftop garden at the back of UCL East. Um, but the garden, as you can see, is pretty bare at the moment. So maybe it will be better. We're, we're developing it, turning it into a much nicer space, doing a lot of native species planting. Um, we'll hopefully be finished later this year. So maybe we'll see a bit more in terms of diversity over the coming months. But back to the science, um, when I moved to UCL, I've taken things from the UK scale to the global scale. So to do this, I use a database called Predicts. Uh, it's a database that's hosted by the Natural History Museum, and it includes lots of data on biodiversity where it's been sampled from all over the world. So this map just shows where we have insect data from, which is really great because normally it's the mammals and the birds that have all amazing data, but we've actually got pretty decent data for the insects as well. So for this data set, we had just over 6,000 sites um, and 264 studies that had insect data covering lots and lots of species, which is really cool. And what this data set does is that it compares biodiversity at different sites. So it's not time series data like we've been looking at before. This is just a comparison in space. So it might be, for example, um, someone's done a study comparing the biodiversity in forests, so a kind of primary vegetation situation, with um, the biodiversity in croplands. Or it might be that they've compared low-intensity croplands with high-intensity croplands. So rather than time series, it's comparing two different sites. And again, we run some slightly less scary models this time, um, but models nonetheless to try to figure out how biodiversity has changed in terms of, or differs between these different land uses. So here we have our percentage change in biodiversity, either number of individuals or number of species. And then we've got our different land uses on the bottom. So here we compare some more natural land uses, primary and secondary vegetation, with low and high intensity agriculture. And it's quite intuitive what we find here for the insects. So compared to primary vegetation, which we have as our baseline, we can see that insect biodiversity is lower in all other sites and quite a bit lower. So almost 50%, and I think 30 something percent in the high intensity agriculture. So pretty intuitive results, but no one had looked at this for the insects at the global scale before. So it was quite exciting. But of course, there are many other threats to biodiversity as well, so we thought we'd try and look at climate change. So now we're trying to combine the impact of these two threats to see what their impact on insect biodiversity will be. So this time, our x-axis is thinking about climate change. So zero will be there's been no climate change. One will be the temperatures are perhaps at the edge or getting towards hotter than species will have experienced in the past and anything beyond one is hotter than they've experienced in the past. So we can see here that for our natural habitats, the primary and the secondary, things seem to be okay as we get hotter in terms of our, our climate metric. 
But for these more human dominated landscapes and particularly the high intensity agriculture, when we combine these two threats, we get quite strong reductions in biodiversity when we compare it to the primary vegetation. So almost 50% reduction in abundance of insects in uh, high intensity agricultural sites that have also been impacted by climate change and 27% reduction for species richness. So some quite dramatic changes there between these different land uses. But luckily it wasn't all bad news. We, did, we were able to find some positives. So very similar figures here, but instead of land use, our lines now represent the amount of natural habitat there is in the surrounding system. So we're looking at low intensity agriculture and high intensity agriculture. So as we go from the red, which is very low amounts of natural habitat, through orange up to high amounts in blue, we can see that the steepness of that line, that decline, is actually reduced. So having lots of natural habitat around a low intensity system means we can buffer against these negative impacts of climate change, which is really good. Really important to know because it means we can manage our habitats, manage our croplands to help biodiversity in this time of climate change. But importantly, we didn't see this buffering effect when we look at high intensity agriculture. So a bit of a sign there that we need to try and move towards more low intensity systems if we want to buffer against the potential combination of these two threats. So yeah, some pretty exciting results, but yeah, this is thinking about insects at the global scale now. And I think it's really interesting, although quite intuitive what we find here, but showing these things at the global scale is really important for getting the message out that you know, even though there's lots of noise in our data, we can find such clear messages. So clearly something needs to be done to help insects within these situations if we want to maintain populations going forward. But more on moths. Why not? So I've also been forcing moths on my family in Essex. Um, they live just outside of Chelmsford. Um, and this is my sister's dog, Albie. He doesn't get to join in because I think he would eat all the moths. But <laughs> you've got to get him to pose. But this has really been great for, again, kind of making me see insects in a, in a different way and encouraging other people as well. So now my, my sister's actually got really into moth trapping too. And she's always like, when you come to stay, can you bring the moth trap? So I've also done some trapping at hers um, in Hampshire as well. Um, and we've been able to find some really exciting things too. And um, this one in particular was quite a, quite a cool find as I think I'd only just started moth trapping myself and I was kind of looking through the field guide and I was like, okay, I think, this, I think this is it, but it's got quite a small blob on the map, so I probably got it wrong. So I did send a picture to Tim Blackburn and said, Tim, I think I found the slow carpet, um, but I don't know. And he was like, oh my goodness, yeah, I think you have. That's great, fine, that's quite nationally scarce. I've never seen that before. So being kind and generous, I was like, oh, don't worry, Tim, I'll put it in a pot for you. And, and you can see it. I'll bring it into the office next week. I accidentally set it free. <laughs> Me and my mum were chasing around the garden, like, where could it have gone? <laughs> I've got to take it in for Professor Tim. Like, he's going to be, he's going to be angry with me. He has never let me live that down. It does come up regularly. Don't trust Charlie when she tells you she's found something scarce. She won't let you see it. Um, but I do like to rub it in every now and again. I've seen something he hasn't. So <laughs> that's always very good. But essentially, the conclusions from my talk, I think, are, you know, we've been able to make the most of the data that we have, and it may not be perfect, but we can still get some amazing inf bits of information from this. Pressures on biodiversity can act together to lead to even greater changes, and we don't often consider these things when we analyse the data. And I think that's a really important thing going forward to remember um, that, you know, threats don't act in isolation. But there are ways that we can mitigate some of the impacts and it's important we think about how we can increase biodiversity as well as just understanding what makes things go down. And I think what I've learned especially is that interactions with, with nature can really change how you see the world. Um, and I think there's nothing better than just a handful of moths. Um, my friends think I'm weird now. <laughs> the, the ones that are left. But no. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> They're like, great, good for you, Charlie. <laughs> um, and I think I'd like to go forward and try to encourage others to be able to interact with nature and get their hands on some moths as well, because I think it can really change our perspectives and really help us to protect biodiversity going forward. So um, thank you very much for listening. Special thanks to the Mothy Tims for encouraging me <laughs> in this endeavour and to Dave the Death, Death's Head Hawk Moth. 
um, that's great. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you for having me here today. So I am going to talk to you about our research project, which looked at the moths and bats of a conifer plantation. So we've had loads of lovely pictures of moths and nice landscapes today. I can promise you absolutely none of that in my talk <laughs> whatsoever, I'm afraid. But hopefully by the end of this talk, I can convince you that the way we manage conifer plantations can improve them for moths. So just a bit of warning, there is going to be a silly fun game in the middle of this which will get you all standing up and hopefully a bit warmer in this cold <laughs> room as well. So when we think of conifer plantations, we think of something a bit like this picture here. Quite dull sort of monocultures of one tree, often sort of a non-native tree species like Sitka spruce. They don't have any understory, it's often just covered in needles. And from a moth perspective, we're not really that interested in this habitat. But we can improve the way plantations are managed, and they are important at a landscape scale. So currently, most of these plantations are managed using a technique called clear fell and replant, which is quite an intensive sort of technique. And in the next couple of slides, we'll go into a bit more about these sort of different forestry techniques. But increasingly, the forestry industry is realising that with climate change, it needs to make its plantations more resilient, um, both economically and to deal with climatic impacts. So with the storms we've had in the last few weeks, the droughts that we've been having over the summers, the way they're managing plantations right now isn't viable in the long term. And that's where this suite of techniques that come under the umbrella of continuous cover forestry could be an answer to this, but can also deliver potentially for biodiversity, which is where we get interested from a moth perspective. Now, you might be sitting there and thinking, well, it's a plantation, a plantation is a plantation, why should we care about that for Patrick? Well, if we put together all the areas of conifer plantations in the UK, that equates to about 1.3 million hectares of woodland which is the equivalent of this square on the map. So from London up to Peterborough and across to Birmingham. Now, in a lot of landscapes, these are our dominant woodland types. So the way we manage them is critically important for woodland biodiversity. Now, this is where it comes on to the, the fun game that you're all going to get involved in. <laughs> so. A regular silviculture is the technique that I'm going to talk to you about today. It's a type of continuous cover forestry. Now, I could go on for the next five minutes with a really dull sort of forestry spiel, but that was not as much fun as what I've got lined up for you lot. <laughs> so, if you feel capable for standing for the next five minutes, I hope you could all stand up for me. If you don't feel like you can stand up, don't worry, that's perfectly fine. I'm hoping this might be a moth recorder's first. <laughs> so what we're going to do first is show you what a normal clear fell and replant uh, plantation is managed like. We are then going to show you what a regular silviculture is like and how it's different and how if you fought like a moth, it might deliver for your needs. So to make you look even more silly, I want you to put your hands above your head like this and do your best conifer tree impression. That's <laughs> superb. So if you look around the room around you just now, thinking from a moth's perspective, you're all the same tree type. If you don't feed on conifer trees, there's probably not much for you. If you're a moth that needs structure in your woodlands, you're all roughly the same height. Again, there's not very much for you. So when we manage these sort of woodlands normally, we do this thing called clear fell and replant. And that's where a whole sort of bit of woodland will get cleared in one foul swoop. So you know what's coming next now. <laughs> so this group in front of me, you're about to be clear felled. Now you have a choice. <laughs> when you're clear felled, you can either just sit down nicely and quietly, 
or you can do it in a really dramatic way. So I've done this talk with kids and they've been really dramatic. <laughs> so on the count of three, we're all going to shout timber and I want you guys to sit down in the most dramatic way possible. So one, two, three and timber. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty good, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make here is that really this is the most amount of structure that we ever get in our normal plantation here. So these sort of open areas are quite important for some of our sort of open specialist moths. So where I live in Aberdeenshire, things like Kentish Glory, cousin German, some of these rare things will come into this habitat. But it's quite an intensive way of managing your woodlands. So what we're going to do now is change what was this even age plantation to an irregular high forest and see how it's different from moths. So if you guys could stand up again. <laughs> so if you just put your hands down by your side so you don't lose blood flow. <laughs> So I want you to imagine a number between one and five in your head. Now, I need to make sure this is going to write. So if you pick number one, could you just quickly put your hands up in the air? Pretty much no one. That's not <laughs> what I was expecting. <laughs> if you pick number two, could you put your hands in the air? OK. And if you pick three? OK, good. Four and five. OK, brilliant. Right, this should work. We'll see how we go. <laughs> so. If you picked number two, what we're about to do is fail you, unfortunately. <laughs> so if you pick number two, could you sit down or be really dramatic about it? <laughs> so with this technique, rather than felling all of the trees in one go, what we do is we just take the odd tree out here and there. So over time, this creates a, a, a sort of light gap, and this means that we start to get sort of regeneration. So if you could now put your hands on your head, you're simulating a sort of understory shrub. So just those people that have sat down, I should say. <laughs> so if you're standing to the left of one of these people that has just sat down, you've just been released to the light. So I now want you to put your hands in the air and put them out like this. So typically in a conifer plantation, we just have one tree. But you guys are now magically turned into a different species of tree. But we've now got this really tall canopy layer. So most trees are felled at 50 centimetres, whereas in this example, we actually keep you up to about 95 centimetres in diameter. <coughs> the people who are number five, what I want you to do is sit down and put your hands on your head as well. So what we've done is we've created another small gap and we're beginning to get a bit of understory regeneration. Those people who are number three, can you just put your hands in your air like this? OK, so you can see that in these sort of some of these gaps, we're beginning to get a bit of sort of tree regeneration occurring. We're starting to get some sort of structure in our woodland as well. Now, finally, those people who picked number four, we're going to go forward several uh, points in time. If you put your hands over your head like this or out like this, it's completely your choice. You are now our broadleaf trees that are coming into our plantation. So thinking like a moth again, look around the room compared to what we saw earlier. There's a lot more structure in this room. We've got a lot more understory. We've got sort of different heights of trees. But also we've got a lot different composition of trees as well. We've got different species of conifers, different species of broadleaf trees, and understory and so on. So thank you all very much. That was brilliant. Um, that's all I was going to get you involved in. <laughs> So I, I hope that was just a useful way of sort of seeing it. Um, you also helped me win a £10 bet with my girlfriend that we could uh, get you all to be true. So, so that, was, that was really good. <laughs> so to show you what this actually looks like in reality, so we start off with the sort of top picture, which is our typical plantation, and we bring it down to what it sort of looks like here. So with this technique, we always maintain this sort of permanent canopy. We're just creating these sort of small forest gaps. And we're just building up these layers within the forest. 
And happily, no one's actually studied this yet, so that's what we went and studied. So we're specifically interested in what these habitat structures, moths, and we also studied bats, were responding to as we sort of transform these plantations. So to go about this, we worked at a place called the Stourhead Western State and the National Trust Stourhead Estate on the Wiltshire Somerset border. So these estates have some of the most developed sort of uh, regular high forest stands that you'll find in the UK. And we focused in in three places. So the first was the sort of very uh, beginning stages of this, so about 5% of the way towards where the foresters want to get it to. So still quite even aged, not much understory. We then focused on a, another stand. So this is about 30% of the way towards where the foresters want to get it to. You can see we're beginning to get some sort of plants coming through on the forest floor, and it's a bit more light. And the third area is this, which is about 60-70% of the way there. So this is the way our plantations could look like if they were managed using this technique. We've got big trees, we've got broadleaf trees, we've got natural tree regeneration, and we've got an understory layer. So we set up 110 points, and at each of these points we measured habitat structures. So various different things like percentage canopy cover of broadleaf trees, how wide these trees were, the amount of canopy openness, and so on. We then did light trapping at each of these points, and if you want to know what sleep deprivation is, doing 110 light traps in a two-week period is, is a real good way to learn. <laughs> Um, so we recorded the number of species and the abundance of all the moths that we found. And for the analysis, we looked at this at a total point of view, but we also sort of began to narrow it down into sort of habitat, so if they're associated with woodland or not, and also whether they sort of fed just on broadleaf trees or conifer trees and so on. We then used static bat detectors to record bat species and their activity. So what did we find? So we found a total of 248 moth species, which is pretty good considering we only sampled in a two-week period. And this is equivalent to 27% of all woodland-associated macro moths in the UK. Most of the species that we recorded were generalist species, um, so lots of sort of footman moths, which are associated with lichens, lots of conifer-feeding moths like tawny barred angle and barred red, and also quite a few grass-feeding things as well. Now, this is exactly what we would expect. This is still a, a conifer plantation. But we did pick up a few scarcer things as well. So waved carpet appeared in quite decent numbers in some of our traps. Perhaps even more surprising were our bat results. So we recorded 13 bat species, which is 76% of all the UK resident bats, and this included quite a lot of registrations for the Barbastel, which is an IUCN near threatened species. We also had a few registrations for greater horseshoe and lesser horseshoe bat as well. So in terms of the stuff that we were really interested in, in these irregular high forest stands that moths and bats were responding to, unsurprisingly, the first thing we found, which uh, the foresters loved, was that broadleaf trees are really important. So this isn't particularly sort of surprising uh, to us in this room. We know that broadleaf trees support a much higher sort of abundance and number of moth species. But the key thing that I really want you to take home, um, and thinking back to our demonstration, is that so often in plantations we're just happy with a very thin strip of broadleaf trees around the edge. But using this technique, we bring broadleaf trees within our plantation interiors. And that allows these sort of generalist moths to spread into these plantation interiors and increase in numbers. But it's not just that simple in terms of the actual composition of the trees. It's also the complexity of the habitat that's really important. So earlier on, when we were sort of messing around being different heights and making those different layers of the forest, when we have more of those different layers, it really increases the richness and abundance of moths that are associated with broadleaf trees. So you need both of these two factors together to be able to increase your moth numbers in plantations. Now I'm just talking about this in a, a conifer plantation sense, but this technique can also be applied to broadleaf woodlands. 
and his economically viable way of managing broadleaf woodlands. And quite often our broadleaf woodlands lack structure as well, so this is a way of potentially uh, increasing their numbers within that habitat. We then looked at canopy openness, and we had quite a neat little tool for doing this, basically a mirror that would face up into the, into the canopy, and that would allow us to very accurately calculate the canopy openness. And what we found was that with moths, generally they were higher in abundance and species richness in the sort of more darker, closed canopy areas, which agrees with sort of previous research. Obviously, that's not true for every single species. And then with the bats, we found the complete opposite. So they had much higher activity uh, around these sort of open canopy areas. So what we need when we manage our plantations, our techniques that allow us to create these variable gaps and openings to support species groups that have these sort of opposing needs. And this is where this technique called a regular silviculture really comes into its own. We also found a similar thing when we looked at tree diameter. So we found that these conifer specialist moths, these ones that just feed on conifer trees, had generally had higher richness and abundance when the trees were actually narrower. Whereas the bat species, Soprano pipistrelle, we found had higher activity around where we had larger tree diameters. So again, it comes to this fact that you need this heterogeneity, you need a mix of different tree widths and sizes within your forest. And again, this is a great technique at being able to do this. So just the final slide. So sympathetic forest management can improve <coughs> conditions for moths and bats and can support a surprising amount of biodiversity, particularly these sorts of generalist species. So it could make an important contribution. For the rarer species, you're still probably going to need to go in and do sort of other uh, management techniques but you can still combine your normal ride management that you would do for some of these uh, species uh, within this sort of forest type. We've identified various sort of key habitat structures that we need to include in our plantations to make them better for moths and bats, and we're advocating for this to the sort of forestry industry. But we also need to be investigating these flexible forest management techniques as well because they can accommodate these sort of multiple species needs. So if you're interested in sort of learning a bit more, we've put the full report on ResearchGate. It's also on the Butterfly Conservation website. The results of the BAT paper have been published in the Journal of Forest Ecology and Management, and we're just about to hopefully submit the MOF results in the next month or two. And I also just want to say a big thank you to the, the wider project team and funders. It was a fantastic team uh, to be part of and a really great site to work at. And I'd thoroughly recommend going and visiting if you get a chance. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you've got now. If you like me and questions pop into your head, please just do drop me an email. And thank you for participating in the demonstration so well. <laughs>
uh, introducing this idea that there are a wide range of issues that are affecting many of our species, not just our day active species, but our night active species as well. Things like habitat loss and climate change are having a huge impact and are um, resulting in a lot of declines and causing a lot of threats for some of, our, um, some of our species, not just in the UK, but worldwide as well. And so, yeah, in 2021, we set out to try and address some of this injustice by, by focusing on this subject and trying to shed some light on the subject of nocturnal pollination. So we wanted to study uh, brambles. We wanted to understand what happens at night compared to what happens during the day, understanding flower visitation rates and what happens in terms of the amount of pollen that's being deposited between different types of insects. And there has been some research done on nocturnal pollination. And uh, Callum McGregor has been responsible for, for really kick-starting this, in my opinion, by doing some fantastic stuff on nocturnal pollination and looking at things like uh, pollen uh, transfer networks. Um, and uh, subsequently, people like Jamie Allison have done some incredible and innovative work trying to uh, explore the subject of nocturnal pollination by studying moths. Um, and yeah, I'd recommend people to have a look at, um, at Jamie's work as well. Um, so why, why do we study uh, bramble as a, a study subject? Well, there's a few reasons, and the first of which is that it's an incredibly widespread and common species. It's pretty much everywhere, any habitat, you could turn around, there's probably some behind me creeping up on me right now. Um, <laughs> it's everywhere, it's really easy to get hold of, and that's a really good in incentive when it comes to studying something. If it's just out there and it's easy to study, then that certainly helps. Also means that any results we can talk about, Technically, we can apply that to lots of different parts of the world. It's not just specific to that corner of the world where we studied it. We can apply that to different locations and people can pick that up and, and try and apply that in their own place. The second reason we chose it is because the flower is really open and accessible. It's what I would describe as a generalist flower. Everything there is very easy to get hold of. If an insect comes and visits that flower, it's going to get what it wants with relative ease. It's not, it's not asking for a specialised mouth part to access the pollen or the nectar. If anything wants to get, get in there and get its pollen or nectar, it can do that very easily. And the third reason we chose bramble is because it's got such a long flowering period. Every year I see it flowering earlier and later in the year. It fly, flowers from spring through to autumn, and now I'm seeing it in November. It, it's a species that provides food and cover and pollen and nectar for pretty much anything that wants it for that really long, study, uh, really long period during the year. So there's a lot of incentive there that if we're studying it for a narrow period of the window, we can apply that to different times of the year as well. And there has been some research looking at bramble pollination, but it's all really focused on what happens during the day. Um, a colleague of mine at University of Sussex had uh, studied bramble pollination but during, during the day at a few study sites in Sussex. And they'd found a, a long list of, of species and taxonomic groups that visit bramble and take advantage of the pollen and the nectar that it's got to offer. So we've got some idea of what goes on during the day, but again, there's that incentive, there's that gap that we can plug by applying some research. So the first thing that we did in our study was we applied a pollinator exclusion experiment. And what that involves is it, we, we, we went out to our site and we placed bags or muslin bags over flowers before they had opened. And this allows us to control the, the, the sorts of things that go and visit those flowers. And this ultimately um, led to us uh, counting the number of pollen grains that we had on the flowers that were exposed at different times of the day. So we had a few different treatment groups as part of this, the first of which was a nocturnally exposed flower head. And so we would arrive at a site uh, at sunset, we would take the bag off, we'd go to bed for about 10 minutes, and then we'd wake up at sunrise and we'd return to site and we'd stick the bag on. And we'd do that for six days. So, um, Patrick was talking about sleep deprivation, this is another really good idea, so if you want to do that, <laughs> give this a shot. And so we also had a, a day exposed uh, treatment group, so the opposite was the case. We would arrive at sunset, uh, sunrise, we would remove the bag, it would be exposed during the day and we'd replace it at sunset. And that allows us to compare what happens during the day and what happens during the night. But we also had a control group, a third experimental group as a control, and we placed the bags over the flowers for the six day period and we didn't bother going to remove them, so we left them on for the whole time. And that excludes any visitors um, to get to the flowers and so gives us an idea really of what happens if we don't let any insects visit the flowers, what sort of numbers of pollen grains are we getting on these flowers. So at the end of the study period, we snipped off the flowers. Uh, we took the female part of the flower, which is called the stigma, and we dissected the tip and we placed it on a microscope, microscope slide and we would stain it with a chemical. We then put it under a, a microscope and we can see the, the number of pollen grains we have because the chemical stains the pollen grains. So we can very easily count the number of pollen grains that are deposited on the stigmas of those different treatment groups. So, one thing to note here, so this is a control stigma under the microscope. One thing to note here is that when we counted the number of pollen grains, it wasn't specific to bramble. So, 
bear in mind that when we, when we come up with a number of pollen grains, it may be that there almost certainly will be a range of different species not specific to bramble. So this is a, a stigma from a control, um, one of the control groups, and there are no pollen grains on this image compared with something that was exposed during the day. These sort of hot pink or purple spots are the pollen grains, um, and they can, believe it or not, be identified to species, some with relative ease, um, but we just had very little time to do this in, so, or I had very little time to do this in. Um, and so similarly during the night, we get something relatively similar. We, we are getting pollen grains deposited at night, which is really satisfying. Um, it wasn't just being left alone at night, but we wonder really what's going on. So in its entirety, the, the results showed us this. The first thing to note is down here that the control group is very low compared to the two experimental treatment groups. And this is telling us that when we exclude visitors, it significantly reduces the number of pollen grains that can be deposited, which, is, which makes sense, that's, that's to be predicted. But what this means is that in practice, that there are some sort of commercial and economically beneficial um, uh, things that can come, come out from this. We know that in the research, if you use bramble or raspberry or strawberry plants, and they receive more pollen grains, then they're more likely to be larger fruits, they're more likely to be symmetrical, things that are commercially important to us. And so there's some tangible benefits to, you know, including pollinators or having more pollinators visit uh, flowers. The second thing that's of note is that the, the, the group that was exposed during the day, or the flowers that were exposed during the day, had more pollen grains in than the nocturnally exposed treatment group. And you think, great job done, right, that's a bit sad, isn't it? We haven't got anything really going on at night compared to during the day. But there's something that we're missing here. And when we think that the study period was June and July of 2021, and at this time of year, the sun is in the sky for the longest period. We have the longest days at this time of year. So when we adjust these total pollen counts to account for this, so essentially rather than having a total count, we develop a rate or how many pollen grains are we, are we seeing per hour of that particular period, we see something slightly different. We actually find that during the night, the rate of pollen deposition or the number of pollen grains that we're seeing deposited per hour of the night is higher than it is during the day, which is really interesting to see. So in summary here, dis despite the fact that we've got more pollen in total being deposited uh, compared with the nocturnal treatment groups, there is actually a higher rate when we make that adjustment um, and account for the shortness of the night compared with the day. And this, you know, asks, this raises a lot of questions really. There's a lot of mis mystery around uh, this particular conclusion. You know, perhaps if, if we have a higher rate of pollen deposition taking place at night, we might expect to have more visitors at night. That's a reasonable and logical conclusion to come to or something to suggest perhaps. So very conveniently, if we take a step back to the beginning, um, at the same time as doing the pollinator, pollinator exclusion experiment with the bags, um, I also set up some uh, cameras to take interval photographs of um, bramble flowers so I could monitor flower visitation. And these cameras were set up to take um, photographs every 30 seconds over a five day period. Um, and so we came back with uh, around about 400,000 uh, photographs. <laughs> it gets a little bit worse. Um, so I had to uh, <laughs> I had to process these manually um, because there was too much noise in the background of these images to be able to allow AI to, to really process them. So I had to go through all these 400,000 images myself to count the number of individual photos that we had an insect present. And this is, our, this is our measure of flower visitation. So here we've got a red admiral visiting some bramble flowers. I think it's two of the 12 of these images. Um, we've got a visiting insect. So that's what we did and we tried to compare what happens during the day and the night. Just the same as the pollinator exclusion experiment. So during the day, as expected, which corroborates a lot of the previous work that's been done by some of my colleagues at Sussex, um, we found a huge range of taxonomic groups visiting the flowers. We had uh, bumblebees and obviously butterflies. There's another bumblebee there. We had hoverflies, we had true flies, we had beetles, we had honeybees and solitary bees. You name it, it was there. We had day flying moths, the lot. At night, however, it was almost exclusively moths that were visiting the flowers. There was, there was pretty much nothing else that bothered. So overall, what did we find? Well, the first thing to mention is that yes, we have a high diversity of taxonomic diversity, at least, um, for the day, uh, yeah, for the monitoring that was taking place during the day. And, but at night, we we're only really finding moths with a few small exceptions. I suspect of flies that just fell asleep on the flower. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this, this is a, a really important finding that we're only finding moths visiting the flowers at night. The second thing to note here is that we, we calculated the rate of visitation. So how many visitors are we getting per hour? And then we can compare with the, the pollen uh, data that we've got as well. 
We find that during the day we actually get a higher rate of visitation taking place compared to what we see at night. Now this was contrary to what we expected. Given that we had high pollen deposition rates, we're not really seeing the same high visitation rates of moths. And ultimately this still raises a lot of questions, but one of the questions is, are moths actually just more efficient pollinators than all of these day active species? And that's again a logical conclusion to come to on the basis of the data that we've got. So in, in summary really, Bramble is a really important source of pollen and nectar. We, we knew that based on a lot of the previous research that's been done. But here we've demonstrated how it, it also provides a lot of important nectar and pollen for our nocturnal insects. And largely macromoths and, and nocturnal pollination, it's not a new study, it's been around for forever, but we just haven't really given it the effort and the time that it deserves. And there's a lot of issues that um, nocturnal insects and nocturnal animals are exposed to and threats that they face that are unique to a nocturnal lifestyle. Things like artificial light at night, it's not something that will have a huge impact on some of our day active species. Whereas our nocturnal species, um, you know, they're not given the time and effort um, that they deserve when it comes to these sorts of subjects. So there's a lot more to be done when it comes to understanding nocturnal pollination, not just for bramble, but for a wide range of other species. So yes, we, we found that initially we had a higher total amount of pollen that's deposited during the day, but when we made that adjustment, we, we realised that it was a higher rate of pollen deposition taking place at night, and that's largely thanks to macromoths, which were the only, or really the only visitors that we found through our um, visitation um, monitoring that we did. But there's still some questions that need to be answered on the, uh, based on these conclusions, the first of which is, are they more efficient pollinators? And there's a lot of work that would need to go in to understand whether this is the case. There'd be some detailed um, research that would need to, to understand the mechanisms by which moths access pollen and nectar um, or interact with pollen and nectar. Um, but perhaps they're just spending a longer period at the time, uh, of time at the flower. And that's something that potentially we could go back and look at our data and try and extract that from what we have. I've got some students back at Sussex that had expressed an interest. I don't th think they really appreciate what they're getting into, but they've expressed <laughs> an interest in, um, in looking at how many consecutive images we have an insect that's present on a flower. And we could use that as a proxy for visitation time. But similarly, we could go out there and collect some new data um, and just look at trying to quantify that more exactly. Because I think that would be quite useful in, in general, uh, looking at how long they spend at the flower. But th there's another solution or another suggestion, which may be that it, it's the mechanism by which the insect interacts with the flower that may be causing these higher amounts of pollen to be deposited on the flower. So things like wing vibration frequency and things like that that might stimulate more pollen to be deposited. But there's a lot of things that need to be uncovered about this subject to be able to be firm about our conclusions. The final thing, which is a bit controversial, is just to be thinking a bit more carefully about how we manage Bramble. So um, after I finished my PhD, I started a job with butterfly conservation. I work as a landscape officer in the southwest and I manage uh, six reserves in Somerset and Devon. And, and I know how much of a pain in the arse Bramble can be. <laughs> it's, it's everywhere, it's getting worse because of issues like climate change. It doesn't, it doesn't stop growing during the winter often and it can be a problem, but there are places where it is appropriate to leave it. And I think, you know, Patrick was talking about creating heterog uh, heterogeneity within our habitats and Bramble can play a really important role in facilitating that and in increasing the heterogeneity that we have. Um, it's not just good for nocturnal insects and day uh, active insects, it's important for us you know, blackberries are really tasty, I, you know, don't like you, I quite like them. But, you know, there's small mammals that like uh, bramble patches, there's birds, there's reptiles and amphibians that will use this, and not to mention the botanical interest that is in, you know, creating protected locations that allow the plants to, to thrive, and the natural succession that, um, that follows. So there's a lot to be said about allowing bramble to grow in appropriate locations. Don't get me wrong, there are places we need to, we need to eradicate um, some of it at least. But you know, places like our parks and gardens, um, cemeteries and, and railway embankments and road verges, there's real opportunities there to increase um, the you know, heterogeneity and provision of an, a really important source of, of pollen and nectar. And it's not just June and July, it's throughout that sum, those summer months into autumn, into winter. And it's not just Sussex, it's the whole of the UK, it's Europe and it's beyond. It's, it's a plant that can really provide a lot of benefits for us. And the final thing I really want to say is that at the beginning, I'd ask that question about, what, you know, when, when I say the word pollinators, what do, we, what do we think of? We think about those day active species. And I really want to see a change in the way that we think about pollination. And there's a lot more that needs to be done to, to affect that change. But I think the work that I've done here really helps to illustrate that point and hopefully get us along that right track to give moths more of, a, more of the limelight when it comes to pollination.
Thank you very much. Hello everyone. Um, so I've got the last slot. I'm just going to show um, a pile of pictures of moths and places I found them in, basically. Um, I called it the Adventures of Moth Recorder in Scotland. I think I might have bigged it up a bit much. I suspect it's the same as the Adventures of a Moth Recorder anywhere. Um, not quite as exciting as Patrick's little game, but I've got a quiz to start us off with. So I've got six moths on the far side that I'm going to talk about, or some of the species I'm going to talk about. Can you name them? Some of them are quite tricky. And on the other side, there are the habitats that I found these particular species in. Can you match them to their homes? Um, there's no prizes, and you're going to have to listen to the entire talk to get the answers. Um, <laughs> but just so I'll give you a few minutes while you're doing that. I'll just introduce myself a little bit. So I'm based in East Lothian, which is the county just to the east of Edinburgh. So we've got the Firth, the Fourth coastal habitats along the north side. Lots of very intensive farmland in the middle, and then the Lammermuir Hills, which are fairly trashed grouse sort of moorland to the south. Um, and I've been recording for about 10 years, something like that, most of the time in East Lothian, um, mostly uh, with battery run traps round and about rather than in my garden. Um, but then in recent years, largely thanks to work, I've been able to get my traps further around Scotland and that's what I'll show some of those now. So I put a little map in the top corner there just to show vaguely where in Scotland I'm talking about and we're starting in East Lothian on the coast. This is John Muir Country Park which is near Dunbar. It's an area of sand dune, a bit of salt marsh, a uh, sandy beach full of dog walkers, surfers, picnickers, partiers um, and I'm sure none of them know of the moths that live here. So there's some really quite nice moths. Um, it's quite close to where I live. I go quite often. And there's another moth recorder who goes quite often, but um, probably not that many more. So here are some of the species that we get here regularly. So these are the ones that I sort of see most years at this place. Um, as, as I was looking through this uh, talk this morning, I realized that I've chosen all these kind of megafauna type moths, you know, the tigers and the elephants and the dogs and things. Um, so some of these are quite um, common and widespread in East Lothian. Some of these are quite unusual. So the unusual one, shark, is actually quite unusual for us. Um, and you get it at a few sites. Dog's Tooth, again, just Aberlady Bay and John Muir Country Park. And sand dart is, is, of course, very restricted to kind of sandy habitats. But the other species, the small elephant hawk moss of the garden tiger, which I put in purely for colour, really, and fox moth uh, are fairly widespread. Um, but there is a much rarer moth, even rarer than dog's tooth and sand dart, that we get here, and this is the white colon. So this species was recorded in the 1970s once, around this, uh, near this place, and then I, by chance, got one in 2018 or 17 or 18, something like that, just one. And then we've been trying to find it again, going, going back the right time of the year, me, Mark Hubit, this other local moth recorder, and nothing until last summer, I caught 20, <laughs> just like that. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure what's going on, whether it's sort of come in from somewhere, whether it's just the case of sort of right, right place, right time, getting in at the, the peak of the flight period. But it'll be interesting to see what goes, what happens this year. And it's also a sort of lesson that never give up on a site, never give up, you know, that, that um, things can suddenly turn up. And that just proves that I did see more than one. <laughs> so now we're zooming off up to the north coast of Scotland. This is Sutherland near Betty Hill. And for a few years I had um, work doing pollinator surveys, the pollinator monitoring scheme surveys um, in some rather lovely places. And I snuck a bit of a moth trapping session in, in, onto the back of that. Took my single man tent, single is important there, um, and spent some lovely evenings, nights, and mornings with midges and some <laughs> nice moths. I did have a, pic a horrible picture of me and midges, but I've removed it. So here are some of the um, moths from, from there in the summer. And the nice thing about taking my moth traps sort of away from home and away, away from East Lothian, where I was becoming quite familiar with what, what you catch there, is, is a bit more of the var variety. 
So we've got Scotch annulet and goldenrod brindle here, um, which are perhaps sort of more specialist to that kind of habitat. Scotch annulet, that was the first time I'd seen that species. But then we've also got much uh, species that I see all the time where I live and, and in other places, mottled beauty, less yellow underwing, but they don't look anything like that where, uh, where I live. And that's another nice thing about moths is the sort of variety. It can make learning to recognise them difficult when you're starting out, but then after that you just never get bored. And particularly lesser yellow underwing, you know, the, the dark forms that they get up in the north of Scotland are just beautiful, just wow. So I think that that was my favourite moth of the morning, that um, lesser yellow underwing. So it's not just about light traps and, and night time. We're back down now in East Lothian um, on the borders with the border Z and Mid Lothian. And this is a Scottish Wildlife Trust reserve called Lindeen. It's very small, um, no footpaths or anything. The, the big picture there, um, I've got my back to the A68, which is a really busy, noisy road. But you go down into the valley, into the, the bottom of this, you can't hear the road. You're, I've only ever met one other person there once. It's a nice um, pool of water to have a little dip in. You can lie back and have a little snooze and you can look for moths. So I've just chosen two species. Um, Mother Shipton is, again, quite a common species, really quite widespread in, in grassy areas. But I can't work out what my pointer is on here. Oh, that. Yeah. Um, but you know, what a beautiful moth. And one thing about going and looking for them by day, you know, trying to track them down, it's a bit more challenging than a, a light trap, and you have to work hard for, much harder for your moth. But you get to see them doing their stuff, and, and that's really nice. And so I spent a long time following this moth, trying to photograph it. Um, she, I think it's a, a female, but it just looks pristine out of the, out of the pupa. And you can see that <coughs> profile of Mother Shipton, this old prophetess or witch or whatever you want to call her. Um, and then on the other side, a note, I've boldly used the English names here, um, Pancalia schwarziella. Um, so this is a beautiful little micromoth with these little um, silvery sort of raised scales. They look like blobs of mercury or something like that. And these were all flying around um, the sort of short grassland. And it was a new moth for East Lothian last year, this. And I think that illustrates again how under-recorded some of these places are, particularly for micros. You know, it's a Scottish Wildlife Trust Reserve. It's had quite a lot of botanical surveying done, but very little moths. Um, so there's new things to discover. And all, all you people who come up sort of to come and see the moths of Scotland, everyone bypasses all the southern areas and they go and to the classic Scottish places to see the classic Scottish species. species and there's lots, lots more to discover. So now staying in East Lothian and on to Mallow Moth. So this has been one of my sort of mini successes. This um, moth was thought extinct in East Lothian in, um, until quite recently. So it used to be a hundred or so years ago quite widespread across the south and then it wasn't seen um, I think 1950 or something like that. It was the last record and then it wasn't seen I thought, well, maybe it's extinct, it's in decline everywhere. Perhaps it's just gone from, from the, southern ed ed the northern edge of its um, range. And then this one turned up in a light trap of mine in East Lothian. Um, but the, the thing is with an adult moth is you don't know where it's come from. This single moth in a light trap, could it have wafted in from Northumberland or somewhere like that? Um, so the the thing to do is either to find more or to look for caterpillars. And so this is a shout out for doing more caterpillar recording. Um, again, you don't get to see lots of different species for the amount of hours you put in, but it's quite satisfying. Um, so mallow, as you might expect, feeds on various mallow species. So this was, we're now in 2020 when COVID hit. Um, so I spent quite a lot of time on my bike going around the lanes of East Lothian clocking mallow plants by day and then by night going back with a torch and there's loads of them in East Lothian and in my corner of East Lothian so in the northeast of East Lothian um, and they're really oops they're really easy to pick out um, 
in the torchlight, they feed really prominently on the tops of the plants. So a really good way to find this species. And we found it in Leith, uh, sort of the north on the dock, dock area of Edinburgh. And I had this little project trying to get lots of people to, to do this and join me called Mission Mallow. And yeah, I wanted records of the plant and then for people to go and see they could see the moth. Um, it also feeds on hollyhock, so it's quite keen to get people looking in their gardens. And I've got lots of records of plants. I've still got lots of records of plants. But funnily enough, nobody was that keen on road verges or car parks or whatever uh, at 11 o'clock at night to look for caterpillars. <laughs> so more work to be done there, if anyone fancies that. Um, staying with single species surveys, and now we've got a real Scottish um, speciality. Um, this is the Angus Glens. Um, this is that man there is Mark Hubert. He's not the Scottish speciality I'm going to talk about. As, but we do a lot of moth recording together. He's my county moth recorder as, and of the Lothian's entirety now. So he's there staring at fence posts and that is um, in search of this moth, the Rannoch Brindle Beauty. So this is a female. Um, she doesn't have wings. Um, this one here is I presume laying eggs into that fence post and so she emerges from her pupa in April, wants to broadcast her pheromones to the males, climb, so needs to climb up as far as she can. Um, they will go onto clumps of heather or whatever but some of them fortunately climb onto fence posts and this makes them uh, much easier to see and this is the male. So the males do fly, but I've yet to meet anyone, there might be someone in this room, who's actually seen one fly. Um, I don't think they're very good flyers, but they don't come to light traps, not that many people have light traps in this sort of place at this time of year. So the idea is you can walk along these fence posts and count the moths. And this is Glen Prozen, a vast sort of the southern, southeastern edge of the Cairngorm National Park, and then going sort of down south towards Dundee. Um, this was a new record for Angus, I think, and certainly for that area, in 2022. So re really recent discovery, um, first found by someone just walking, just a hiker, who alerted the moth community somehow, and you know, all six of us, or whoever it is, <laughs> descended on the glen and found, found that they're you know, quite, quite widespread throughout this area. And at the same time, there was a recent article in Atropos about that some guys who found similar up in the flow country around Leg. Again, I think it was a new, new records in 2022. So this moth is probably much more widespread than we think. There's just nobody out there at the right time of year looking, because these aren't on the main paths. You're cutting across the moorland where the fences are. And the other interesting thing about this site, Glen Prozen, is it's just been um, brought to a sort of rewilding project by FLS and they're going to do tree planting and encourage natural regeneration, lots of tree growth, which will be really lovely for lots of things. It's a very sort of bare, bleak, trashed moorland. But, you know, what will happen to these open habitat specialists? Um, and it'll be interesting to maybe set up some longer term monitoring for this. Now, Patrick, <laughs> staying on the um, forestry team. So I now work for, at the moment, work for forest research. So last summer I had a little project, very small scale project, looking at invertebrates on clearfell sites. So when Patrick was talking about this um, clearfell restock system, this is what it looks like. So quite apocalyptical. Um, you can see another um, stand of Sitka spruce in the background there, you know, and that will be completely felled um, in future years. So it looks really quite devastating, but what lives there? Well, actually, again, as, as Patrick alluded to, some, some really lovely moths do make use of this habitat. So this area was um, Loch, just north of Loch Tummel, Loch Tummel, Loch Rannoch area, which is a really good um, area in Scotland for moths. Some really lovely species live there. There's the Blackwood of Rannoch and some really sort of good semi-natural habitat where you do get these species. Um, but, you know, in the middle of my, these big clearfell sites, we've got Cousin German, Silvery Arches, Northern Arches. Um, the thing about Northern Arches was I caught, um, I think it was over 60, you know, they're little heath traps, but over 60 in five different traps in the middle of clearfell on one night. So I think, and I think that's um, unheard of, you know, that, that number. 
So these habitats are supporting the moths in some way. How can we manage them and make them better for that? Uh, and finally, hibernating heralds. So I don't, uh, many of you, or some of you, may know this project that I've been involved in for mm, maybe seven years, eight years. I was here talking about it probably six or seven years ago. The hibernating herald project. So that's looking at this moth here, the herald, which is a really beautiful uh, moth that doesn't look like any other of our moths, really. And they overwinter as adults. So at this time of year, they're tucked away in dark, sheltered places, waiting for the spring. And the picture there on the um, right is a whole bunch of them tessellated on uh, dangling down root. You know, a real spectacle. So when, when you see lots of them in a place like this, it's just like mind-blowing. Um, so the Hibernating Herald Project has been trying to encourage people in winter when there's not much else to do on the mothing circuit to go and look for heralds. So grab a torch, find a dark place. You can all do this tomorrow if you want <laughs> um, and see what you can find. And we've got um, culverts, lime kilns, old castles, caves, um, anywhere that's dark enough, your garden shed, anywhere that's dark enough to need a torch really and a little bit sheltered perhaps from the wind. So lots of people have taken part. We've got a Facebook page which is gathering traction. There's been quite a lot of input from uh, people south of the border now as well, which is really interesting. So I'm you know, interested to know what happens with heralds further south and, and in terms of when, what time of the year they do different things. Um, this... <laughs> I don't know if you can guess who that is. That's me. Um, so we found lots of things. We, we're doing lots of monitoring. We've got um, eight years now of, of data, some from the same site, so you can start to look at trends and changes and that sort of thing. But one sort of striking result is if you look in the National Moth Recording Scheme data between 2017 and 2020 in Scotland, um, heralds out of hibernation, so light trapping and sugar and that kind of thing, just 329 in the same period, our hibernating herald survey counted nearly 11,000. So, you know, orders of magnitude difference to the numbers and our impression of abundance, depending on how you record them. Um, one of the lovely things about this is you're only looking for one, well, you're not only looking for one moth, you're going to the same places, you're seeing the same moths. On the whole, they're doing absolutely nothing. But the sort of sheer number of hours I spend doing it, I get to see some nice things. So there's this lovely aberration that was um, found last year. We're looking at overwintering mortality. So um, wrens do quite a lot of damage. Bats at the beginning of the season when the moths are coming in. And then in some sites you get this rather, I'm not sure whether beautiful is the right word, but this um, fungus, entomopathogenic fungus that um, forms these sort of sprouting, fruiting bodies from the, from the corpses. Um, Again, it'd be quite nice to know more about it. We have had some of it sequenced, as so we know one of the species of fungus involved. And then this year, I was quite excited um, to find heralds hibernating in a hollow tree um, here. Um, so no one else might be very excited by that, but I was. <laughs> um, it's been something that I, yeah, I'd wanted to find, and I'd quite like to find one in a badger set next. I'm not, not quite sure how feasible that is. And then the other thing is, of course, all the other wildlife we find looking in these places at this time of year, because surprisingly, not many people record wildlife in these sorts of places. Um, so lots of things from wasps and slugs and um, butterflies, and then just a couple of moths here. So Rigognostis annulatella, coast diamond back. I've only found that still in one, one site, but a really nice moth, a bit like the diamond back moth. And tissue, of course, the tissue. So the tissue moth is a whole other talk, and it's probably what, no, well, it is what motivated the Hibernating Herald project in the first place. It was discovering a, uh, an overwintering tissue in East Lothian that motivated it all. It's still probably my favourite moth of all time. Not very common in Scotland, but we do get to see them each year. Um, I've been lucky enough to join some of um, some some of the recorders in the Yorkshire Dales, where they get hundreds of these, and it's just a, a total different, dif different thing going on, but um, they're just beautiful. 
And then last slide is really, or nearly last slide, is just a shout out to all the people that I encounter on my travels with moths. Um, you know, it's a really wonderful community, both online and the people that uh, I meet in real life. So we've got you know, moth mornings and caterpillar surveys and all sorts of things. Um, and Mark and I did find a Clifton Monpari, well, we found seven Clifton Monpari in East Lothian this year, which is really exciting, in the same wood. So we think possibly they're breeding there, which should be a first for Scotland. And now a plug for two books. My book, uh, Meetings with Moths, which came out last April or May. Um, I can't praise it because it's mine. But also <laughs> coming very soon from two Scottish legends, moth legends, Roy Leverton and Mark Hubert, the larger moths of Scotland. So they've got together um, the dream team that they are and they've written this atlas of Scottish moths and it looks really good. It's be out in, I guess, March or April probably. Um, it's going to be distributed by Atropos. So that's just a message to keep your eye out for that. The end, I think. Yeah. <laughs>